Page family, what's good? This is your boy Solomon of ITBM2, the official channel. I am here live with solving the race problem. This is uh, I'm one of the members of uh, the debate league that I'm running over there on Solar Vision Debate League, and he has some information that he would like to drop and share to the family. Um, and actually, solving a race problems. He does seminars on solving the race problem. Um, when the brother come on, he's gonna uh, give you his information as to where um, to contact his uh, website. Uh, where he do, does those things, and uh, I believe that he also does live presentations as well. Um, so with that being said, we have set up a um, he has set up a PowerPoint where he's going to um, give us an introduction to uh, what he breaks down um, in solving the race problem. So uh, without further ado, we're going to hand this thing over to the brother. Uh, his, he goes by the name of Brother Abdul Kelly. Um, so what's going on, Brother Abdul? Peace, brother Solomon. Peace, peace, man. I uh, wanted to start out and say I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thank you for giving me, you know, this platform to speak to the people and, you know, get my message out there and try to give people something constructive, something helpful um, that they can use in the future. How, how's my volume? Can you hear me? You, you good. You good, brother. All right, cool. Um, as brother Solomon mentioned, I go by brother Abdul, also the founder of Solving the Race Problem. You can reach my website by going to www.solvingtheraceproblem.org. Again, that's www.solvingtheraceproblem.org. As he mentioned, I do educational workshops. I do professional development training, all centered around cultural competency, diversity training, uh, which I refer to as solving the race problem. What I'm going to present today, um, this is a sample. This is sort of like a free appetizer um, into what I do. So feel free to like, share, subscribe, comment on the video. I will read the comments. Um, people in the chat, I do read um, those as well. You can also share the video, send it to somebody who you think it would be useful for um, because you never know who might need it. We're all affected by systematic racism, white supremacy. So you do not know who may or may not need it. And again, when you go to the website solving the race problem .org. you will also find a phone number and an email to contact me and um again i'm just looking for an opportunity to build with the people so i'll, I'll start out the presentation uh, right now and again if if you want to contact me all of my contact information is on the website so here we go and the first thing i'm gonna do soul of mine if, if you right there and for the listening audience that watches this, I want you to look at this picture that I have right there on the screen. And I'm going to give you 15 seconds. I'm going to give you 15 seconds to count from one number and get as far as you can. For example, if you look in the top left corner, number one is right there. And then I want you to find number two, which is sort of in the top right middle. And then you'll go to number three and number four and so on. You, you get what you're doing? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna give you 15 seconds. Go. All right, stop. How far did you get? Got to the 51. You counted all the way up to 51? Now, what was I doing? I was looking at all the numbers. Yeah, no, no, no. So you start in order. You start at one, and then you find two, and then you go find number three. Oh, no, no, no. Start and up. then find Do it again. Four. Do it again, bro. I think okay, I misheard I'm gonna get, Not a problem. So, again, everybody else is listening. You can try this activity as well. You're going to start out with number one, which is in the top left corner, and then you have to find number two, which I told you where it was. And then find number three, find number four, find number five. And you can go as far as you can in 15 seconds. I should have probably explained that a little bit better. So I'm going to give you 15 seconds to see how far you can get by finding the numbers and counting along. So I'm going to give you 15 uh, hold on, seconds. One second. Hold on real quick. Wow. Well, because um, it's something that's blocking the. Oh, uh, where it says, oh, the, hold on, this part? Yeah. Yeah, how that? Dude. Oh, okay, okay. Now I got it. My fault. All right, so now you can see the whole thing. Same task. Start at one, go to two, three, four, five, six. Count where you're going, but start out at one and then go in order. You got 15 seconds. You clear on what you got to do? Yeah. All right, go ahead. Okay. 
like, all right, stop. How far did you get? I got the two. I couldn't find three. If you look, three is kind of in that to the top right of it, of two. Okay. Oh, so yeah, you, I see it. Okay, so then you got the – now I'm going to do this, and I'll tell you that in every box you'll find the number. So number one is in the first box, two is in the second box, three is in the third box, four is in that fourth box, five is in the next one, and so on. You see? Yeah. Now I'm now I'm gonna give you 15 seconds again, and I want to see how far you can get. Ready? Go. Yeah, I'm done. All right, how far did you get? I finished it. <laughs> now you see, the 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 purpose of that is to show you the importance of context and framework. You were unable to even get to three when I didn't give you any context, I didn't give you an outline, I didn't give you any guidance. You weren't able to get very far, but then when I provided a framework for you, you were able to accomplish a lot more. That's to show you how important context is. The reason why I do that is to show you that when we are dealing with racism, white supremacy, we're similar to this first picture here. We're, we don't know where to go. We're running all types of different directions. We're trying to find things that we can't find. What solving the race problem does is give you that context. It gives you a framework. It gives you a way to look at economics in education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, war, healthcare, housing, technology, to see all of the different areas of human activity, to see how racism, white supremacy affects all of those things. And you're able to accomplish a lot more when you have context. So that's why I wanted to do that. that that's the purpose of that quick activity is to give you context. Moving along. That's a light. That's, that's a flashing light to wake anybody up out the sunken place. I'm going to just deal with it like that. I need to talk to the real you. I need to talk to the, the person that's behind the person because we have a lot of people that are sunken in the sunken place. And this flashing light is just supposed to wake you up because I can't have a conversation, a real conversation, the, the uncomfortable conversation about racism, white supremacy. And we don't even have people in their right state of mind dealing with it. Um, if you don't catch the reference, this is from a movie called Get Out. Uh, came out a couple of years ago. It's a real good movie that unpacks uh, the racial dynamic in a contemporary sense. So that's what that's for. Your next one. You're going to hear a lot of terms and definitions that I'm going over um, throughout this presentation, but I want to give you definitions. So don't get too um, bogged down by a lot of terms that you see on the screen because I am able to share this presentation. If you email me and ask, can I send you this presentation? I have no problem um, sending this to you so you're able to look at it, <clears throat> look at it again and review it. White supremacy. White supremacy is the elephant in the room when we are talking about racism. It's any thought, speech or action that promotes the ideology of white superiority over non-white people. These ideologies can manifest themselves in the field of economics, education, entertainment, Labor, law, politics, religion, sex, war, technology, healthcare, and housing. That covers every single base. Racism, white supremacy has infiltrated every single aspect of society. And we have to understand that and we can progress and try to solve these problems. The next topic is racism. The next term you'll hear. That's a deliberate and systematic direct or indirect destruction of a people classified as white implemented on people who are classified as non-white. It's for the purpose of establishing and maintaining, refining and defending wealth, power and privilege. The only functional form of racism is white supremacy. That means the only people who have the power to implement something as deep and insidious as racism are people who are classified as white. As we replace racism, we work on replacing racism, white supremacy. We have to find something to replace it with. The thing that we are attempting to replace it with is a term called justice. Justice as a promotion of two fundamental ideals. It's guaranteeing that no person is mistreated under any circumstance. And it's also guaranteeing that a person who needs the most help gets the most constructive help. All of these terms that you're seeing me go over, a lot of these are compensatory terms. 
which means that I've constructed definitions I've added into the definition because I wasn't satisfied with what I was getting or what I had already seen. Non-white, that encompasses many of the people who are going to listen to this message and hear it. Uh, solutionary, that's a term that uh, you probably won't find in the dictionary, another compensatory term. It's a person dedicated to solutions. I, I tend to be dedicated to solutions because we can talk about the problem. We need to talk about the problem, but we also have to discuss solutions and how to go about that. What is the race problem? The, as, as I mentioned, the, the title of it is solving the race problem. So what is the race problem? And I'll tell you, based on my research, based on my empirical data, my, my own observations, there's a global conflict between whites and non-whites that we refer to as racism. Racism is at the epicenter of all major world problem, which means that it would be nearly impossible to solve any other world problem without confronting the race issue. The race issue is at the epicenter of all other world problems, whether you talk about uh, drug violence and gangs, or if you want to talk about immigration, or if you want to talk about the housing and homeless disparity, if you want to talk about the food shortages and agriculture, race always plays an element in all of those things. So instead of us trying to attack race and politics, and then attack race and economics and then attack it in education. I'm showing you that we have to see this as a system dynamic. That's one of the crucial fundamental understandings that racism is a system. And once we start to unpack that in, and I give you context, you'll be much better suited to, um, to dismantle it. Here's some significant statements that I've come across over the years. And I found these statements to be some of the most crucial things that may have been passed by by black people one of them is from neely fuller he said this in 1984 he said if you don't understand racism which is white supremacy what it is and how it works everything else that you understand will only confuse you you will be confused into thinking that racism doesn't exist you will be confused into thinking putting on um a make America Great Again hat and going to the White House um, with Trump, you would be confused into thinking that you're somehow included in a post racial society. In 2009, Eric Holder, who was attorney general at the time, he said, Are we a nation of cowards afraid to talk about race? That's a tough question to answer because the reality is most people classified as black are afraid to talk about race. Why? You are not able, most black people are not able to openly talk about racism, white supremacy, mostly because it gets them, they're uncomfortable when people talk about it. That's the first thing. The second thing is that if you're at your job, you're not allowed to say racism, white supremacy in most instances. And as soon as you start talking about racism, white supremacy at your job, you're going to be looked at as a black identity extremist, or you're going to be looked at as people think that you're crazy. But for the most part, we unfortunately are afraid to talk about race, even though it's the elephant in the room. We'll talk about it in the conversation where um, we'll discuss the symptoms of racism. We'll talk about the symptoms that we see from racism. We'll talk about those things, but we'll rarely, if ever, address the causes. And the cause of it would be systematic racism, white supremacy. Uh, the third significant statement I found is Harriet Tubman said, I freed hundreds of slaves and I could have freed hundreds more, hundreds more, had they known they were slaves. And, and you got to keep in mind, this is during a time where people literally had chains and shackles on. And they thought that they weren't slaves. Why does that matter? Because in a contemporary sense, when we work a nine to five, even though we don't want to, we pay bills, even though we don't want to. You are an economic slave today very similar to what your ancestors went through during antebellum slavery we're going through a new version of that today the the prison industrial complex is proof of that as well as the basic power relationship between whites and non-whites has not changed one iota since antebellum slavery was was um was removed the power relationship between whites and non-whites has not changed since then number four uh, Dr. Amos Wilson said, if you want to understand any prob problem in America, you need to focus on who profits from that problem, not who suffers from that problem. 
And again, a lot of times when we have the conversation about race, we'll talk about the people who are suffering from it. We'll talk about um, the, the disparity in the black community, the drug problem, the violent problem, the, the problem of gangs, uh, the problem of no adequate housing, the, the food problem, the economic problem with no jobs. And we'll talk about those things, the people who suffer from the problem, but we'll rarely talk about the people who benefit from it because the people who benefit from it are the ones you pay your rent to. The people who benefit from it are the one you buy your groceries from, the one who makes sure you have electricity in your house. You see, the one who pays your pay, the one whose name is written on your paycheck. So we don't talk about the people who profit from it, mostly because it, it goes back to that number two. Are we afraid to talk about race? I think every black person should look themselves in the mirror and ask that question. Number five, Kwame Ture said, if you want to get black people to believe something, tell them that white folks said it. Hmm. Which is un which is unfortunately true. That is a fact that we have allowed another group of people be able to legitimize what we say and do to the fact where I can do a presentation like I'm doing on racism, white supremacy. And for me to be validated, I have to show white scholars because I presented this in colleges. I go, you know, do this on an academic level as well and people will not see it as legitimate unless you quote white scholars black people are the same way we don't feel people are legitimized unless they have the backing of a college or a university that they got a degree from a white person or a white person giving them a pat on the back or some type of accolade and we see that as something significant and um then then we'll believe it and legitimize it now i'm gonna need your opinion on some of these soul of mine and maybe we can get some um, ideas from the chat if there's people in there. So the next part of what I usually do, this is a move and react type of activity in which we see if people agree or if they disagree about the statement. So I, I just want to hear from you, Solomon, if you're still there. Yes, sir. So the, the first statement is we are living in a post-racial society where race does not matter anymore. Racism is old and outdated. I would even say it doesn't exist. So if somebody walked up to you and said, we're living in a post-racial society where race doesn't matter anymore, racism's old and outdated, and it doesn't exist, do you agree with that or do you disagree with that? I disagree with that. And, and why? Because the reality of the situation is that we don't live in a post-racial society. Um, yeah, so it's just like, you know, overwhelming evidence showing that we don't live in a post-racial society. And I don't really know. Uh, I believe that that, that, that that term came up with the election of Barack Obama. But even during you know um, his campaign, you've seen the escalation in uh, police murders of unarmed black men. So, I mean, even um, when the term actually began to become popular, we were still dealing with uh, race issues. And hold up. And, and I agree. And something that Jerry Taylor, who's a white supremacist, he runs the American Renaissance uh, channel, which is like the pseudo intellectual white race realist. Um, he says something that I agree with. He, he basically said that race is too important um, to ever get rid of. And if a if a person classified as white, a white supremacist holds that position. We have to understand that those being the ones who control and dictate how things move in society. It doesn't seem like they have any intention of getting rid of, replacing or dismantling racism because it benefits them too much. So I agree with you that I don't think that there, there will um, ever be a post-racial society because race is, is far too important. Um, moving on to that, to the second statement, issues of class, sex and poverty are more significant in society than race. Do you agree with that or you disagree with that? If somebody said that to you. You said class, sex and poverty. Yeah. Class, sex and poverty are more significant in society than race. For example, you'll have people who will talk about um, intersectionality and say, well, yeah, you know, race is important, but poor people suffer just as much as black people or women suffer just as much. White women suffer just as more as black people. So what do you say? Do you agree or disagree that like that intersectionality argument? Um, the issues of class, sex, poverty, that those things are more significant in society than race. Like those things um, hold more bearing. What do you think? Uh, I think that uh, race is the number one issue in American society. 
I yeah, I agree, a hundred percent. For the third one, uh, black accountability is more important than focusing on racism, white supremacy. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? And what that means is, black accountability basically, the we shouldn't worry about what white folks don't are doing, and we pull up our pants and we go to work every day. Um, then we won't need to focus on what racist um, white supremacists are doing because we're doing what we need to do. Do you agree with that or you disagree with that? I would have to say I agree with that. And, and why is that? I think that um, if we if we do what we 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 supposed to do, I think that that would um, reveal the hidden hand of racism, the hidden hand of covert racism. So I, I believe that we first have to really do that, you know what I mean? Because I think what they, what the races, the type of racism that exists today is more covert. So what they do is they 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 manipulate the masses with images, and uh, the images is stereotypical. It's kind of creating uh, or criminalizing us through the mass media. So I think that if we represented or conducted ourselves, um, you know, in opposed to that. As a, as um as opposed to glorifying aspects of that culture, I think that that would kind of um force their hand to you know show what they really their real intentions are. Okay, and w- what do you think would happen when we do see their real intention, their real hand? What do you think would happen? I think that um it would be a conflict. It would be a conflict uh, between. Us in the system, kind of similar to what was going on during the 1960s. Okay, and and I see why you say that, and you know I, I do agree with you to to some degree, but I'll, I'll unpack the black accountability a little bit more just so I can get on to your um you know to the next one, which I want to see if you agree or disagree. Racism, white supremacy, it manifests itself in the educational institutions, like things like schools, colleges university etc would you agree with that or you disagree now now repeat that you said does racism right racism it manifests itself in the educational institutions like schools colleges universities yeah yeah i believe so and and why do you say that because of the curriculums i mean you have um at temple university they had one of the um a very good African American studies program that always was challenged. I believe that it was challenged um, so much so that they was actually um, it was uh, the the other the other um, curriculums were actually trying to fight to get it moved from uh, Temple University. Um, so that's on okay. a collegiate level, but like you know in um. In elementary and uh, middle and high school, you're not really taught. Of, you're not really taught about your real history. You know what I'm saying? They give you these images, or they give you this uh, created history, um, which kind of gear you to be an integrationalist. That's why, I like, it's like Martin Luther King. You know, back when I was growing up, it was like Jesse Jackson. You know, all these people, and our history was kind of relegated to um, us contributing to um, American society. It's not not like our real history, like um, what we was doing before we were enslaved. It was pretty much showing how good of a slave we were. I think right. that that's kind of what it was kind of like focusing on more so our actual history. So it was like we was memorizing all of the inventions, the Gary A. Morgan, the stoplight. And, you know, it was like we was just like, like it was like a, this like programming, I believe, that... Um, mm-hmm. They kind of was just making us um, memorize key figures within American history that kind of added on to establishing this great nation, as opposed to our real history. Because our real history is, you know, signifying aspects of rebellion. Um, I don't think that they touched on the history of the slavery. Um, They kind of kept it vague. You were slaves. The masters here. They didn't really define who the masters were. Because the masses were actually the presidents that they want us to honorate, so they didn't mention that. Um, you know, the real revolutionary, hardcore revolutionaries were not taught about, like uh, Marcus Garvey and the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Um, 
they they prevented us from actually studying the people of that time because you know uh growing up in the early 90s i'm in middle school this is when khalid muhammad was actually doing a lot of his um you know uh speeches and even like the the um the growing influence of the uh black studies you know that was kind of overlooked they don't really want to engage that uh they still kind of create these images of people that weren't white they kind of um depict them as white such as the the ancient egyptians um you know and all you know a lot of other inventors who actually uh, were people of color you yeah. know the list goes on and on you know what i'm saying it's kind of like a, a whitewashing of you know um history and um they give you still these uh negative images of africa um they don't really um tell the truth about the role that they had in um deconstructing african civilization um so you know yeah no all of those all of those things are 100 percent true and it's good that you were able to look at it and see your racial um position and see how the attempt is being made to uh denigrate what that is now if more black people had that same mentality or had that same understanding we probably wouldn't be so apprehensive to make our kids be a part of their schools and us ourselves try to be a part of their universities because as, as you mentioned it is so deeply ingrained and, and one thing that i did want to touch on as far as the misrepresentation of africa i do an activity like i said i work in schools so it, it seems to be the belly of the beast outside of politics because a lot of the misinformation is spread through the classroom. A lot of the indoctrination, a lot of the normalization of what racism, white supremacy is, is passed down within the school. So I see it every single day. So the, the thing with that happens to be um, I do a, a quick activity with students. Sometimes I write Africa on the board. And I'll ask them to come up with different words. You know, what words come to mind when you think of Africa? Real simple um, starting out activity. I'll get words like poor, <clears throat> dark, AIDS, um, broke, hungry, tired, black. Um, no terms that you would overwhelmingly see as positive, beneficial things. And then if you put a term like Europe on, it's rich, white, clean, pure. And this is the indoctrination that even um, middle school, high school, elementary school kids have picked up over the years that they've never been to either place, but they're already normalized into understand. They're already normalized into the misinformation that everything white is good and everything black is negative. So I'm going I'm to start to address some more of those misconceptions like um, again, I, I usually do this presentation in groups of people. So when I do the di agree or disagree, you do start to get some um, you're able to get a lot of different perspectives and you'll hear some of the misconceptions. You didn't have any of those because we we, we kind of on the same page as far as our understanding. But not all black people who work in schools are. And that's who, you know, this message end up um, coming coming through or coming by. The, the first misconception is that um, racism is not always somebody being mean to you. We we have come to equate white supremacy with um, the redneck white person in a pickup truck who will call you the N word um, and has a Confederate flag. That that isn't what white supremacy is. You have um, the covert white supremacists who could live right next door to you, drink beer with you, and you might even call them your friend, your lover, your coworker, your colleague. Um, so we we get tricked, we get fooled that since white people are nice to us, quote unquote nice. We somehow feel as though racism doesn't exist. Um, another thing, the, the second misconception is the notion of acting black or acting white. In schools, I see this happen all the time. Um, a quick story. I, I had a, you know, a young lady. Um, she was raising her hand, participating in school and whatnot. And some other black girl said to her, you know, why are you always acting white? And the, the girl said, well, why? Why am I acting white? What's, what's acting white? And they was like, I don't need just acting all white. So, you know, that's a teaching moment for me. I step in and I asked them, I said, well, what, what is she what is she doing that's acting white? She raising her hand. I don't know. She, you know, talking property and this and that. So so th th this is when I said to them, well, why is it that 
anytime is something participating in your learning or having a command of the language that those things are acting black. I said, if that, I mean, if that's acting white, then what is acting black? And they just look kind of confused because they understood that anytime we do something positive and we have positive things that we would attribute to being positive or learning, participating in school, we call that acting white while simultaneously, uh, if you have a white kid who have his pants hanging down and listen to rap music and want to talk slang and ebonics with you, we'll say, oh, he acts black. He's a wigger. He acting black. So we don't take the positive things and attribute that to us, even though we were the creators of mathematics. We were the creators of science and arithmetic and language. And they don't see themselves participating in that as acting black when, in fact, I tell them participating in your learning that is acting black. That's the very essence of acting black. And then I usually don't hear that anymore. Um, but but that's a misconception that we carry with us. The third one is that there are some white people who have lived very tough times. Therefore, racism doesn't exist. Mind you, I have white people that come to um, my workshop, my training. Uh, a lot of times they might say that I'm a racist or don't call me a racist on my reviews and my evaluations. But I, I've heard them say, well, you know, I lived a tough life. I was poor. We didn't have anything. And they use that to make the assumption that racism doesn't exist because they might have been poor or they might not have had what the next white person has in which I respond to that by, yeah, you might be poor economically, but socially you are not poor. And also the misfortune that you've experienced in your life was not because of your race. If a black person is poor, they could very easily make the case that they have limited opportunities because they are black because of their skin color any hardship that a white person faces has nothing to do with their skin color at all until proven otherwise the next misconception assimilation worked out better than nationalism um th there was a conversation last night um after the brother's interview about voting in the practicality of voting and do we think that participating in these types of uh, structures would, would that help us and I and I say that that only furthers into the illusion of a democratic society the illusion that racism does not exist because we we do think that assimilation that us working our way into white society and going to their schools and going to their restaurants we somehow feel better off when white supremacists themselves call nationalism one of the greatest threats black nationalism um, one of the greatest threats. So even if we look at our conditions within education that we thought integrating into white classrooms was going to help us. If you look at the overall literacy of black people, if you look at the retention rate, if you look at the suspension rates, if you look at the expulsion rates, um, the dropout rates, all none of those problems were fixed by going to white schools. In fact, you can make an argument that we are worse off. Materialistically, do we have access to more textbooks and better um, electronic devices, yeah, possibly, but the overall condition of the average black student has not changed by integration itself. The fifth one, what are some ways white racism? And um, I won't go to that. One. I'll go to number six, the black accountability politics, where you do have an entire group of black elites, uh, boule, black folks, the, the elite black who will talk about the causes of the problem. It's that big Bill, Bill Cosby pound cake speech. If you Google that and look at that, it sort of encompasses all of this. Well, what I'm talking about, about black people paying attention to the causes of racism and not addressing the symptoms. We are good at talking down to our own people and talking about the causes of racism and looking at the community and talking about all of the causes, all of the ill effects of racism. But we, ra we rarely address the symptom um, as to why those things are happening okay so this is a disclaimer that there's two sides of the coin um i'm going to address the problem now i'm going to get into addressing the solutions so before i get into this we're, we're going to take a deep dive down into racism white supremacy what it is and how it works and usually a lot of times i have um people in the audience experience some cognitive dissonance the cognitive dissonance that they're experiencing is because what I'm saying is different than what they are accustomed to hearing people talk about when having conversations about race. So let's get into it. Um, this is an image that I put on to 
show a graphic of what racism, white supremacy is and how it works. And as I go into each one, I do highlight the who, what, when, where, why, and how racism, white supremacy is currently manifest itself in all of these areas that you see right here on the screen. It's an interlocking, intertwined system that's maintained, that's ensured to maintain um, white power within society in every area from politics to religion to war to economics to entertainment to every single area they weaponize all areas of activity to ensure that they can stay in power over the non-white class here's some of the who this is who the people are it's the very put people who you pay your rent to the people who live next door to you uh the people who are at the bar with you when you want to go get drunk your co-workers um th this is who is who i'm talking about you have two ends of the spectrum as i have here you have the covert racist white supremacist and you have the overt one we easily recognize the overt white supremacists you can call them white extremists white supremacists they might commit hate crimes violence they'll call themselves white nationalists race, race realists they might call themselves conservative or republicans they are the overt ones they will tell you you are black and i don't like you on the other end the one that we are confused by is the liberal hey. white supremacists oh go ahead yo hold on one second i'm gonna uh see that they're not seeing the image oh they see it. they should be able to see it now all right go ahead brother okay. okay um so the the liberal um white supremacist is no different than the conservative white supremacists um these people they might even acknowledge white privilege they might talk about white privilege and say that i don't use the term white privilege i don't recommend anybody else does but um they'll talk about it in that sense but they won't ever talk about what to do about white privilege but if you want a more modern example something that could to pin this down to help you understand it the trump verse um clinton presidency run presidential run was very crucial because it encompasses this slide right here trump would be more of the overt racist white supremacist the one who would be more outspoken about his um feeling toward you clinton would be on the covert side notice that they are both racist white supremacists on the same team operating for the same goal how they deal with you is what's different the interesting thing is we get confused by the covert because um hillary clinton would dance a jig um go to go to the churches pray with you um, get Mary J. Blige to to sing with you, and we get confused by that. But the the Trump effect, the new Trump effect that is coming into play, um, is starting to normalize the more overt racist white supremacists within society. And what you mean? Yeah, it, it was. It was 100% um, because th those are black people who are co-opted. Unfortunately, Jay-Z and Beyonce, when they brought her on the stage and hugging her and saying, we endorse you, th they too have been co-opted. The main point that I'm trying to get across by showing you this image is for you to understand that all white people are racist until proven otherwise. I said all white people are racist until proven otherwise. We have to get that nailed down and understand that definitively because they all fall somewhere within this spectrum there is no white ally there is no white friend that's going to help you and detriment their own community until proven otherwise this this is a crucial thing that black people have to understand the reason why i'm doing this presentation right now is to help further our understanding of what it is we are looking at every single day and running into this is what I'm trying to do. That is the point. What is it? What is the culture of racism, white supremacy? It's racial oppression. It's normalizing the culture of white privilege. It promotes stereotypes. For us, it, it um, 
focuses in on accomplishments of individualism. The it establishes the culture of white nationalism. These are things of what white racism, white supremacy is, even down to the fact that the people who established the white ethno state, the, the so-called founding fathers, these people are revered as um, the, the pinnacle of Western society, even though, as you mentioned, Solomon, they own slaves. And they said very detrimental things about black people, Thomas Jefferson specifically. These men were rapists. These men um, had no care for the black community at all, but we still revered them because the culture of, of white supremacy is so established and so ingrained. That's what it is. Here's the when. When did racism, white supremacy get enacted? My best answer is I don't know. I don't know when it was established, but I do know it was established. And the proof of that is that it's here right now. The establishment of racism, white supremacy, that is the start of it. It then went into an, a, spa, a stage of expansion where they expanded from Europe and they started to go into other places like Africa, like into Asia, like into North America. And everywhere they went, they did the same thing. They slaughtered the indigenous population. They tried to impose a religion on them. They put on their own economic and they exploited the land. They exploited the people. And this has been the European normal th this is this is a characteristic that the that the european has enacted every single place that they've went some of the indigenous exterminations through this expansion space stage um i've mentioned the tasmanian extermination this was a time that they went to a little island underneath of australia after they went and killed you know most of the indigenous the real aboriginals in australia there's a there's a group of people in australia called aboriginals the, the true aboriginals they went there, they killed a bunch of them, locked them up, set them on fire, um, put them into missionary camps, which are basically like a concentration camp. Then, you know, after they did that, they went down to Tasmania, uh, which is a little island underneath of Australia, and they killed every single person. Like every natural born Tasmanian is dead. There, there's no more left. They exterminated every single one. They were putting bounties on their heads, um, charging $50 to come back for a head of a Tasmanian man. $25 for a woman and they had a price for a child. They were throwing them off a cliff, stabbing them, um, burning them. They were doing terrible things to the fact that they killed every single one of them, mutilating their bodies, putting them on display. Um, the man, William Crawther, who was responsible um, for a lot of the death and destruction, they they erected a statue of him right in the, um, the capital of Tasmania. This is like sort of the smear it in your face that we colonized you, we took everything, and we're going to erect a statue um, right here in the middle of, of your country. Um, the transatlantic slave trade, that was a part of the expansion. Once they expanded their empire of racism, white supremacy, they then went into the phase of maintenance, where they had to maintain the system and figure out what works and what doesn't work. That's when they implemented laws like the Jim Crow laws, um, segregation laws, antebellum slavery, the black codes, where they started, the, where the civil rights movement started, to seeing out what what can we give black people? What can we give and take? We gotta maintain the system. Beating them every day, hitting them um, doesn't work because sometimes they wanna fight back. Um, that doesn't work. Putting our foot on our neck, beating them, that, that hasn't proved to be as successful. So let's find something else. Let's call it, let's call this slavery sharecropping and let's pretend that they're now a part of our, um, of our agriculture and we're just, using that to help them out. The sharecropping was another brand. It was another thing of maintenance, maintaining racism, white supremacy. They just call things by different names, but it's not much different, but it's still in the maintenance stage, them just trying to get it right. The stage it's in right now was refinement. It's in its refinement stage. Um, they're just fine tuning small things and finding out new ways to subjugate you. Um, they put forth the illusion that we're in a post-racial society after Obama. That's the Obama effect. After Obama was <clears throat> put into office, um, it, it, it put forth, it ushered in this post-racial society, which is basically people saying that racism doesn't exist anymore because you got a black president. Um, societal integration, when they start talking about liberalism, mass incarceration, that happened under the refinement stage. The school to prison pipeline, that's currently happening under the refinement stage, they're trying to find new ways to destroy the black unit, to destroy the black family. 
That's the when. So I gave you the who. I just gave you the when. Now I'm going to give you the where. Where can you see racism, white supremacy? One of the most prevalent areas you'll see it is housing. Because um, there's, there's a such thing as gentrification, which I think most black people are familiar with in most major cities. Um, in Philly, where you know I've lived for quite a while, Philly is being gentrified. I live in Washington, D.C. now. Washington, D.C. is being gentrified. And probably the city that you live in is being gentrified, too, if you're listening here. Um, they had something called redlining where they would designate certain parts of areas and towns as predominantly white areas. They'd raise the property value and they would use that to establish these red lines where they didn't allow um, non-white, specifically black people, cross over these red lines. And, and what this did, they, it ended up biting them in the ass because this is what eventually led to the housing um, crash, what crashed the stock market because they had these artificially inflated prices of houses just because white people lived in these neighborhoods. And then when it collapsed in on itself, it was because of the artificial pricing. People were paying more money to get away from black people and live in predominantly white neighborhoods, which means what? Which goes into racial tipping points. If you Google racial tipping points, you'll find out that once the non-white population in any area reaches anywhere from 10 to 15 percent, you'll start to see white flight. Which means if you have an all-white neighborhood and the non-white population, whether that's Indian, Asian, Black, once the non-white population gets to about 15 percent, that's when they notice a lot of studies have showed that white people start to leave. Because if they see if the non-white person can live next door to me as a white person, I'm not doing well enough. Housing is a major area that if you peel back the layers, you'll see racism, white supremacy ingrained deeply within housing. The next area that we talked about was education. Education, racism, white supremacy is pretty noticeable in education from everything from the curriculum to naming the schools to a lot of different parts that you will see it there. The media. Media is heavily indoctrinated with racism, white supremacy. Just turn on your TV and see how they talk about the mass shooters. I think there was just one in Pittsburgh today. If you listen to the coverage of it, um, a lot of times they will describe these people as lone wolves. They won't say that they're a part of a larger criminal organization, which most of them are. Um, they'll, they'll try to protect these people. They may not release their picture. The, the media does a great job of protecting white people and being one of the first to denigrate and disenfranchise black people on every area. So that's just the news. And we even go to the entertainment area. You'll rarely see shows with progressive black people and when you do have it those shows are few and far in between and they just cancel one the cosby show is one example you can make a thousand basketball wives tyler perry's um all of these you know different types of shows that de depict black people in negative light through media we can get pounds in in, in in plenty of that but when it comes to be having a positive representation of media for black people we don't get that wealth and jobs there's plenty of research, which I do have in, in uh, my next part where I cite some of those things. The wealth and the jobs, the disparity between black people who are doing the same jobs as white people getting paid way less. Um, those results are out there the two, two black people, a black person, a white person, same education, um, same upbringing are making way less. The, the wealth disparity between the two, it, the, the only factor that can definitively be placed on the differences between the two is their race. So you can definitely see racism, white supremacy in the types of jobs, the wealth that's in society, and even what it carries into the criminal justice system, which I'll put justice in quotation marks because there is no true tri criminal justice within this system. How, here's the how. How does it work? I gave you who, I'm giving you who, what, when, where, here's how. It works because it's on autopilot. White people don't have to actively disent, white people don't have to actively subjugate you right now because society is already on autopilot. They, they already have everything in place. White supremacy, it's in its refinement stage. It's been so normalized that we, I'll at least say all white people either actively or passively participate in it. All of them. Because it's, even if we look at things like our word choice, and 
things, if things are how things are acknowledged, what has status, who gets recognition, who gets legitimization, who has credentials, all of those things are normalized and ingrained and legitimized by the white society. So it's on autopilot. It's being normalized. That's how they do it. Here's one of the major areas that I see it. Racism, white supremacy in education. We have all mostly been a part of schools, um, went and attended a school at some point. These are some things that you can notice racism, white supremacy right off the bat. The Pledge of Allegiance itself, as you're pledging allegiance to a flag that you were never intended to be a part of, you weren't considered a human being when this flag was being fought for. If you look at classroom content, if you have kids or if you remember any of the assignments you were doing, look at the classroom content. Look at what you were learning about. Look at who you were learning about. I'll give you an example. Um, I teach biology, so I have to talk about um, James Watson and Francis Crick. And these were some of the main contributors into some of the writings that legitimize the myth of black inferiority. These are men who made contributions to the DNA model, but they also talked about the inferiority of black people and they, and they validated their research through the same DNA that we got to teach the kids about. Carol is Linnaeus who put forth um, the binomial nomenclature in um, systematics as far as ranking and classifying human beings. We, we have to learn about him as far as classification, but we don't apply and we don't, or they don't get the full picture of, he put races on this classification as well. Even if you look at school names, there's a school right down the street um, from where I used to live in Virginia called Stonewall Jackson. Stonewall Jackson was a Confederate general. There's a Robert E. Lee Highway right down the street. There's a Jefferson Davis Highway. These are Confederate generals. I happen to live in Virginia, so they're all over, but they might be in whatever town you're in, too. Streets, schools named after Confederate generals who sought to it to enslave people who look like you. But white society has deemed them positive enough, good enough person to name a school after. When we look at the terms that are used within the classroom, if we call students bright, we don't really understand the negative connotation that comes with calling somebody bright in reference saying, oh, you're smart, you're bright. And subconsciously, we may not think about it, but what that does is equate intelligence with being light because we always talk about light and white as positive things and dark as negative, like I'm in a dark mood. Even if you say I'm enlightened, like I'm thinking about this new, I'm enlightened. That's why I've changed that term to darken. You'd be darkening me by giving me something new. But the, the words are the glue that hold racism, and white supremacy together, especially in education. Um, the OAR, uh, the, the Center for Civil Rights, um, they put out some work last year in which they were looking at the discipline referrals, how many kids are being uh, reprimanded within schools. And of course, it follows the, the path line of black getting suspended from school, blacks being um, blacks dropping out, blacks getting expelled um, at a way higher rate than their white counterparts. Um, a lot of times you might see people promoting sports and entertainment to the black youth. I instead of promoting education, or promoting something else, we will promote sports and entertainment as an outlet for the black youth as if that is their only way to contribute to society, that they can they can entertain white folks. They can dunk a basketball, they can run up and down and catch footballs, but how dare we tell them to be an engineer? How dare we tell them to start their own technology business? We oftentimes, I see it in schools, they oftentimes push the black kids to the sports and entertainment without realizing, or they might realize it, but they still do it anyway, knowing that that's an empty path. Most people that want to play sports at a professional level never get there. They're not good enough to get there. They don't have a drive or something else happens. Most people who play sports never get paid for playing. 
even if you play at the high school level, you play at the collegiate level, you're getting reimbursed with something, but you're not you're not getting paid any money. They'll actually put down sanctions on you if you take money for, for giving out your signature, signing a football, signing something. They will put sanctions down on you for trying to get money. The very few brothers that make it to the NFL or to the NBA, make it to the professional level and make money playing, they have short careers because you're expendable at that level. You're a $40 million slave. And even with the sports and entertainment, people might say that, oh, you're getting paid at college, which carries me into my next point. I, I've made the, the claim that college is a scam. Yes, I went to college. I, I did get my, my bachelor's degree from Millersville. And yes, I went to college to get my master's degree that I got from George Mason. And I'll be the first person to tell you that college itself is a scam. And I'll bring it all full circle, the name of George Mason University, where I went to get my master's degree in educational administration is named after a white slave owner, George Mason. OK, so we run into this problem every single where, every place that we go. Here's some of the crucial understanding. If you just picked up the message right here, these are some crucial things um, that I want you to understand. Racism is a system. The, the, if, if you don't listen to anything else, if you didn't understand anything else I said, screenshot this slide, okay? Just pay attention to this, this part right here. If you missed everything else and, and nothing else made sense to you or I didn't do a good job of explaining, listen to this. Your crucial understanding, racism is a system. That is crucial to nail down. These things that I'm going over are a part of the black code that every black person needs to be on page of understanding these things. Racism is a system. The next thing is racism and white supremacy function is one in the same. We have to get that nailed down. It's not, you know, just somebody being mean to you. Racism and white supremacy are one in the same. You do not, you as a black person do not have the ability to be a racist. You need to think critically about the role of the white ally, the so-called white ally. If you had a white person who was willing to help you, the first thing they can do is talk to their white counterparts. They don't need to come talk to you about how to solve racism. They need to be talking about talking to the person who they go fishing with, talking to the white person at their Thanksgiving table. Go talk to those white people. If you got a white ally coming around, oh, I want to help. I want to, you know, come solve the race problem. Well, go talk to your white friends. You don't need to come talk to me about anything. So be very crucial of the role of the white ally. Also, as I get into solutions, which is the next phase of the presentation, um, black empowerment, it can be achieved through economics and education as a start. I'm by no means saying that that is our end goal. But if we want to change things over the next 50 years, we can start to tackle education and economics as a start. OK, and um, so don't mind if you had any questions or anybody uh, from the chat, if they had anything, we could get a couple more perspectives in. You want to take a little break or anything? Or are you still good? No, I... I do got I do have a, a little bit more, but I, I was going to, you know, see if we wanted to get <clears throat> um, address any any questions in the chat before I, you know, keep going. Because the next part is about the solutions. But if, it, if it's any. Say that one more time. Mm -hmm. Nah. Right. Absolutely. It, it, and that and that's what I'm gonna use to 
to carry into the to the next part which i'll tell you there is no magic pill there is no one size fits all magical thing that i can tell you that's going to solve the race problem but we do have to know that there's two sides of the coin there there's the symptoms and then there's the causes of the same problem so do you think that it's true or false that there's nothing we can do about racism i agree with you so being as though there are solutions out there i like to um liken it to the analogy of there are more than one ways there's more than one way to escape a prison right the prison analogy of racism white supremacy i heard neely fuller use this analogy and it works it's, it's somewhat like a prison there's more than one way to get out the prison we don't have to all agree and try to all run out the same exit we just all, all have to agree that we want to escape the prison or we want to reform this prison and change it into something better if we can agree on the goal we don't necessarily have to agree on the methodology of how to do it so yes there are things that we can do about racism and i'm gonna go through a couple of those um when we're dealing with racism white supremacy we have three options we could choose to cooperate which is basically us um doing what white folks tell us to do cooperating with their system and what they ask us to do go to their colleges um go to their schools work at their jobs that's one option we can petition we can ask white people to um start to treat us better we could go to voting and try change it that way we could make demands quote unquote demands and have picket signs and do protests or we can revolt we can revolt and that would be counter violence that would be using violence and counter violence to revolt against the very same people who are trying to kill you those are the three options and everything that i have is framed within one of those three things so here we go here's how you have the solutionary mindset one these are things that you can start um putting into play today right now you can buy black as i mentioned economics is a piece that we could use in real time today you could buy black you can make sure that you are supporting other black owned businesses as best you can if you need to go to a gas station and you in the middle of your town and there's no black owned gas stations because there ain't many that i know of then you got to go to the arabs and fill up your gas i understand that but if you want to get um toothpaste for example or toilet paper for example a, a quick plug for the freedom paper company there's a black owned paper company uh paper towel company tissue company toilet paper company that'll deliver right to your house freedom paper company you could go and we buy black and pretty much all of the household items cleaners um all of those things that you need they're on there you can support another black person to start to nail down the fundamentals of group economics so buying black is a step that you can do the, another thing you can do is build a black family you can have self-love you can love um have black love that that doesn't mean going outside of your race um finding somebody building a black family is the first step the first revolutionary step is you building a black family right at home showing your sons and your daughters how to treat women or how to respect men um how to provide how to protect how to nurture you can start building a black family today you can combat racism white supremacy in every area of activity throughout your thought speech and action so that means um something like when it comes to entertainment tomorrow sunday a lot of brothers like watching football we have a rift in the nfl where they are resisting racism white supremacy by kneeling at the flag and they try to lock kaepernick, kaepernick out if you continue to support that you're not combating racism white supremacy if you are listening to um music produced by white people like laura cohen who's made it clear that he doesn't care about the black community you are not fighting and combating racism white supremacy if you have your your kids in the school getting miseducated by a white teacher who doesn't know anything more than you and doesn't know how to teach at all who's 20 something out of college you are not combating racism white supremacy how do you combat it what's one thing you can do you can have constructive behavior everything that you do should be constructive in your thought your speech and your action we got into an interesting conversation last night about um, marijuana and if that's constructive what, what's the constructive benefit of a black person drinking alcohol um going to the club 
smoking weed. If there's if there's no constructive benefit to it, we shouldn't be doing it. If there's no constructive benefit for you, you know, loading up a gun and doing a drive by, then we shouldn't be doing it. If there's no constructive benefit of drinking lean, we shouldn't be doing it. Non participation is the next thing. This non participation is interesting because for black people to do it, it takes no effort. Like it takes zero effort to do. It won't cause you, you won't, it won't cost you any money. I'm not asking you any money. If you stop participating in European systems to the best of your ability, that would be the black sit. The black sit is exiting from their education system in homeschooling your own kids. That's one thing. Black sitting from their economic system to the best of your ability, which is difficult because we still got to pay our bills and we still got to buy food with their money. But black sitting from their economic system as far as not contributing to it in a materialistic sense, in, in spending your two hundred dollars on a, on a Gucci belt or some Louis shoes um, or any or, or a, a Versace hoodie or whatever it is. Don't contribute to their economic system carelessly and um, to your own detriment by being materialistic. You could black sit out of their political system and stop participating in voting. Mind you, these things are all free that you can do that. The, the black sit could apply to every area of activity. Their military, their war, you could black sit from that and saying, I'm not fighting your war of imperialism whether it's in Iraq or Guam or any other place that it happens to be or North Korea that they want to enact it. I'm not participating in that. We could use economic advancement and in entrepreneurship, which would be um, using entrepreneurship in a sense that we, we try to create our own businesses. I've created a mobile notary business, which I run and operate, and it was not hard at all. If you are interested in learning how to start one up on your own in your city and in your state, I will be more than happy to tell you how to do it. Um, a brother, Andre Hatchet, I learned from him. He has videos on YouTube. Go look up how to do it. It, it probably took me one week and it'll give you an extra two to 200, 250 to 300 dollars a month. You know, just doing notarizations. That's an option. If you want to advance economically, I can show you a plan on how to do that. I've created a business called Solving the Race Problem. This is a business that I created. OK, so we have to think about ways that we can create and use entrepreneurship to our advantage, because if we do have our own opportunities, we don't have to rely on Jared uh, Pulowski at Target when he tells you to stack them boxes up higher or, or go collect the shopping carts. Or even if you sick and you got to go into work or you got a headache or you don't feel like dealing with white folks today, you got to go do it just because. So we can get some freedom through entrepreneurship and economic advancement if that's the route you decide you want to take. Separation and control. Uh, another option would be to separate and control the environment that we are in. This will be difficult because anywhere you separate, it'll be racism, white supremacy there. So to the best of your ability, wherever we do or you choose to end up separating, try to control your local politics, your local economics to the best of your ability. And always keep in mind that this is a relay race. Nobody is asking you to solve the race problem by tomorrow. What I suggest you do is think of this as a relay race. Our ancestors did a good job of setting us up in a position in this part of the world where we are the most comfortable, we're the most well-fed. We have access to the most resources and opportunity in this part of the world. That doesn't mean we live in good. We still live in like dogs. We just the most comfortable dogs. We got the, the best um, outhouse to be in as dogs. But since we are in that position, we have to be serious about pushing forth this relay race because it is a relay race. We have to do our part to make sure the next generation is set up, um, set up well and able to succeed. But those are some of the solutions. And again, um, I do this entire presentation and I go into more depth and more specificity depending on um, what it is. But if you had questions about any other solutionary mindset, any any solution based uh, thing, Solomon, I'll, I'll take your question before I move on.
One, one thing we could do is when we start to produce our own, make that cool. Here's what I mean. FUBU, FUBU was crucial. FUBU was a crucial thing for the culture. It is for us, by us, and people liked it. We saw that as the wave. FUBU was the wave. That was cool. It's for us. It's by us. We making it popular. Now our mentality has sort of shifted that now we look toward rich white old racist italians and we like their brands but if we had an option like fubu if somebody could bring fubu back like if you want to do it i'll help you out like if we could bring an option back like that it would at least start to wean black people off of that and saying hey look we got this alternative option the other thing which i don't think would be as effective would just be to cut cold turkey um with the brother sway lee uh Black Beetle, he sing Black Beetles, him and it's another young brother with the dreadlocks, uh, little rappers. They went to a uh, Versace store and they didn't want to, you know, treat them right. And he said, all right, they y'all canceled. No black people should be buying from them, even though they've been mistreating us um, for decades. Finally, some people, some are starting to wake up that these are owned by rich, um, racist, white Italians that don't care anything about you. So we can either cut off cold turkey and stop supporting them or we can just get a better option um, that would be by us something like how FUBU was when we had that. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Because we, we drive the culture. It, it, black people of this part of the world, we drive what the dominant culture is globally. Black people here drive that. So do we have the power? Absolutely. If we were having this conversation and you and I were in the UK, I would say no. But black people here in this part of the world, oh yeah, we drive the culture. So do we have that power? Absolutely. As far Um, it might be somewhat problematic, but I would just ask them, what's our what's our alternative? Because the current path we on <clears throat> isn't working. So what do we have to lose by trying this new thing? And, it, and, and there's black people globally. So, I mean, whatever we established, I'm, I'm sure there were black people in South Africa wearing FUBU. I'm sure there are black people in Russia wearing FUBU. So there would be an instance in which even the globalists 
uh, black person would see what we are trying to do and they would support it. And, and it works both ways because I would tell black people in this part of the world to look up what Julius Malima has to say about a lot of stuff, because that's a brother in Africa who's talking directly about race, who does seem to have the best interests of black people globally. So even the globalist outlook, because we're all dealing with the same problem, no matter what part of the world you're in. Um, but yeah, well, that, that's uh, how the, I would the people in the that. chat didn't hear me. I, was, I asked the question um, was. Uh, was a lot of the things that he has filed was uh, along the lines of separatism. And I said, um, would that be kind of problematic in a growing global consciousness? You know, so that's what he was answering. I couldn't hear it. Okay. Um, I'll move on. I just got a little bit more. <clears throat> now, Ditto, if you got any questions, um, you let me know. This um, is a, a part, I won't go over all of them, but this is a part that I put into the presentation. Uh, these are look yourself in the mirror and gut check questions for, for any black person who's listening to this presentation, who is hearing this message at some point. If you look, all of these questions are good, but one that I want to focus on is number four, why do non-whites lack the strength or courage to replace or dismantle racism? That's a question that we need to ask ourselves. That's a question that we need to look ourselves in the mirror and think, why do we lack the strength or courage to replace or dismantle racism? Because if we had the strength or courage, there wouldn't be any need for this presentation. There wouldn't be any need for this business. There wouldn't be any need for any of this because it would already be solved. It would already be fixed. And the very fact that I would challenge other black people to have that strength, to have the courage to want to get up and do something about racism, because the option, the other option, the alternative is we are going to continue on a genocide slide. There is no need to be fearful because everything that white people can do to you, they've already done. They fired you from every job. They've hung you from every tree. They put you on slave ships. They have killed you. They raped you. They strangled you. They set you on fire. They castrated you. They don't. They they can't do anything more to you. So we can't be. We can't continue to be fearful of things that they've already done. At this point, the the the, the hey, situation um, where hey, solving race, you know, it's a slight delay from the actual stream. But a brother had a question in the chat room. He says, um, "Oh, go ahead. What what can we do? What can I do right now to solve the race problem?" I just went over some examples of things you can do. You want me to go back on that? You can buy black. You can start a black family. You can can you can combat racism, white supremacy. You can start be. You can start having constructive behavior, meaning not drinking, um, only going around other black people when it's constructive. Stop smoking weed. Stop drinking lean. Um, you can non-participate. You can black sit from your job, from the political system, from the economic system. You can start, you can do um, entrepreneurship, economic advancement. You could separate. Those are all things you could do today, right now. And and I have more. I mean, keep in mind, this is a sample. This is an appetizer. But those are things you could do today. You could do those things right now to start to solve the race problem. How do you solve the race problem? It's dismantling racism, white supremacy. How do you do that? By going over the things I just said. Those are options. All of these things are options that will work. If you want to assimilate better, I'll give you an outline on how to assimilate better. You know, but but these are all things that would help to contribute, that would help to do our part in the relay race of solving the race problem. I hopefully hopefully that answered his question. If he has a, you know. As another one, I want me to clarify more. I could. Um, these things are just questions to use um, for productive racial dialogue. I won't go through each one. Again, I can share this presentation with you if you are interested in it. But another thing you can do doing is have productive. Oh, you don't need enough people to do it. And I wouldn't worry about getting enough people. You worry about doing it yourself. Right. And if it starts to work and people see the benefits of it, they'll start to do it, too. 
black people are too eclectic for me to try to say all of you do this one thing because we won't do it. I'm, I'm realistic enough to know that I can't tell black people uniformly to all do the same one thing. It won't happen. That's why I am about options. That's why I went here. That's, that's why I'm about options. If you want to assimilate, I'll show you how to advance economically and have entrepreneurship. If you want to separate and have your own control, I'll show you how to do that. If you want to not participate and you don't want to pay any money or you don't really want to work that hard, you can stop participating. If you want to figure out how you can do this in real time, build a black family, support another black owned business. Like that's why I'm giving you options. You can pick and choose a collection of these things, one of these things or none of these things and see which work best for you. But you will not get all black people to agree on doing that together. That will not happen. And I'm not and I don't I don't think that will happen if he has a plan for how to get all black people on the same page. You'd be a million dollar person because we were too eclectic. We, we think too differently. We're too we're a diverse group. You know, we won't all get on the same page of one thing. So you worry about doing it yourself and for the people around you. OK, if you, if you got a circle of influence, you start doing some of these things. And if it starts working for you, do it for your circle of influence and then it could spread. But don't worry about trying to get oh all black people. We all need to agree to do this before we have to start doing it. No, you worry about the individual first. Neely Fuller's book is the individual. Um, it's the it's the independent, the united independent compensatory code system concept being. And I like that title because we are all united but we're independent within that unity. Okay, so th to answer that question. And with that, and how we continue to be productive would be to have productive conversations about race when we... He can jump on the panel, man. I have no problem with that. Could you repeat that question again? Yeah, if you're if you're doing this on your own, what's the issue? What what's his what's his question? Like if you if you're doing this on your own and he's saying if what if enough black people don't want to do this? Is yeah, that what he, he said? Say? So if I'm doing everything you say on my own, but no one else is, how will it work? Because he, I guess he's speaking in the context of huh. it only can work if enough people is doing it. No, 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 that's a hypothetical because there are black owned businesses that you can go support right now. You can go get a black woman who likes you. If you're a man or if you're a woman, go get yourself a black man and you can start a black family. You, you need to get somebody else on board if you want to start a black family. But these are things that are already set up that you don't need to go get all black women. Got to go agree to be with a black man. You just got to find one to agree to combat racism, and white supremacy. You can do that today. You don't need any other black person to agree with you to to do that. If you want to have constructive behavior, you don't need anybody to agree with you. You don't need enough people to agree. You can choose to not do it yourself. If all you and your partners, y'all want to go out. And, and drink beer and go sleep with white women every weekend, you can say that's not constructive. I don't want to do that. They don't have to agree with you for you to choose to eliminate yourself from that. Economic advancement, that's for the individual. I can show you how you could do that. Non-participation would be you doing that. You don't, you don't need to get enough black people or a group, a handful of black people to do that because none of these options rely on the collective of everybody doing it. That would be nice, to have the collective of black people doing it, but it doesn't rely on that. And I thought about that as I constructed these things. But maybe, maybe if he had, if, if I'm not answering this question properly, you can have him um, jump on the panel and I'll answer. Okay. Um, like I was saying, so about having productive racial dialogue, a lot of times it will boil down to how we think, speak and act. 
and speech is one of those things. And as we are speaking and trying to dismantle racism, white supremacy, speech is a part of that. How you think, how you speak, how you act. Yes, those things do um, matter. So how are you speaking? I would say keep it in a constructive, productive lane as far as racial dialogue. And those are some questions right here on the screen that I thought were useful. I'll get into some African proverbs. One of them says, by the time the fool has learned the game, the players have dispersed. And that's an analogy to how we are today as black people. By the time we learn what racism is, how it works, the players will have dispersed because we're playing 400 years to catch up. I'm putting forth my time and energy to make PowerPoints, to do workshops, to show black people what the problem is before we can solve it. Like uh, a doctor has to understand what's going on with you before they can give you a solution. So before we can come up with a solution, we at least have to understand what it is. That's part of what I'm doing. And another African proverb is just because you cover your eyes, it doesn't mean the sun has disappeared. That you can cover up your eyes and you can pretend that what I'm talking about doesn't exist, or you can say that what I'm saying is irrelevant or it doesn't matter. Um, that's, that would be you covering your eyes, but that doesn't mean the sun has disappeared. That doesn't mean that racism, white supremacy has disappeared just because you choose to ignore it. Here are some conclusions. The responsibility to change racism, white supremacy is on us collectively. There, we cannot rely on white people to change it. We can't petition them to change their ways because they haven't proven to want to do that. So the responsibility of how to change it is going to fall on us. And I, I included some of my research. I'll breeze through it. Um, these are, you know, just some pieces of research that I included as well. Um, some peer reviewed articles. If you wanted to fact check anything I'm saying, I'll put those out there. And then I put a, um, an extension activity for some suggested readings. Some of the people who I've learned from and um, have contributed to me. Um, but again, I'll send this presentation out if anybody is interested. This is a the free version. This is a sample of you know what I do and you know the different directions that I take it. And again, here's my email and here's the phone number um, that I provide here. I'll leave it up if anybody wants to um, jump in. If they need me to go to any slides, you know, you just you just let me know. All right, all right, shout out to solving the race problem. Um, if y'all guys have any questions or comments, feel free to uh, do so in the comment section. Um, we'll give y'all about a couple of minutes uh, before we close this thing out. And um, yeah, I think that was a very co a constructive uh, presentation. I think that is much needed in the 21st century uh, due to the fact that um, a lot of us are... Um, victims of a lot of things that he was espousing on uh the presentation and i think that in order for us to solve the race problem we have to um embed or inculcate a lot of the things that he's saying into our culture you know i think the problem that we run into because everything that he said was on point and correct but i think that a lot of things that deter us or have an impact in influencing us to do a lot of the things that he was speaking against is because culturally we don't really have nothing to protect us from that. So it's just kind of like it's not frowned upon to be rotting the bins. You know, <laughs> it's not frowned upon to be rotting around in the bins. You know, it's glorified. It's glorified to um, wear Versace. You're glorified if you have these Italian uh, designer. So I think that um, what needs to be done, I think that in order for it to be effective, it would have to be a cultural revolution. That's the, that was the importance of hip hop in the 1990s because they had certain, they had some aspects of that embedded in the culture in the early 90s. Um, so it kind of made it a lot easier for the layman, the person who don't like to sit in a, uh, presentations and a person that is not really that book savvy to kind of fall in line with what the goals and aspirations are, you know. So I think that uh, that's what we need to be kind of doing at this point in time, like uh, reforming the culture, 
needs to be a cultural uh, revolution. Because a lot of people, they, they will not challenge anything that the brother said. Um, but, the, you know, they're inclined to, you know, wanting to be a part of the, the crowd. So... And that and that's a again that that goes to changing and having a solutionary mindset that that we should be attempting to be more solution based and solving the problems if we are serious about pushing the black community forward. But a lot of times I find that a majority of our people don't care because if we get enough elbow room within white society. We feel as though we're comfortable. Everything's okay with me. Therefore, everything's all right. And I don't really care about the collective of black people. We might think, okay, we got a nice job. I got a nice car. Um, to hell with every other black person because I did it. Therefore, everybody else can, which it doesn't take into consideration that you could equally be um, that poor black person. And if you pay checks away or them firing you or a false accusation, you'll be in that same condition of the Pookie and the Ray Ray that you're talking down on. Right. You know, um, so, you know, uh, a lot of other things, too, like um, the the influence of integrationalism from other black folks, too, I, I believe is another problem because, you know, we we could take control. I mean, once again, that was the significance of like, you know, um, black power being in the modern music that would that people was listening to or that the youth was listening to back in the late 80s and early 90s you know which would have us wearing medallions and you know um african medallions and you know things of that nature uh either that or we have to influence the people the people that's quote unquote are the ambassadors of you know our political um expression like the jesse jacksons and the al sharptons they're kind of viewed or honorated as, you know, these individuals that um, represent our political um, uh, mentalities, and they are integrationalists. Uh, that that's a that's a problem because, you know, if we want to do a lot of things to solve the race problem, um, as what Brother Abdul presented, then uh, that will go against a lot of the things that they they stand upon, and they influence a larger body of people. So. Mm -hmm. and, and if I could just ask you something about um, integration, I've kind of dealt with it and I've come to the conclusion and you tell me what you think that I don't think our ancestors that they were trying to disenfranchise us further by having us follow integration, e even though, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, we can look back at it and say it wasn't the best choice. But wh what do you think was in the mind of the first wave of assimilationists that were pushing forth that doctrine? Do you think that they were being manipulated by white people? Do you think that they were co-opted in agents to, you know, destroy us further? What, what do you think was the mentality, the mindset of the the first wave of the integrationists? No, I think that they were just fighting for just, you know, um, rights. They were just like fighting for rights, you know, that would be in American society that they were supposed to have. Like, I, I feel as though uh, they felt as though that, you know, if they're working downtown and they wanted to catch a movie, that they ain't got to go all the way across town to watch the movie if a movie theater is in Center City. You know, or like, you know, um, just the basic things that the very immature, greatest society, and that's the white man, had. Like, you know, I don't want to drink out the same water fountain, or you got to go to a different bathroom. You know, they had to express their superiority. That made them feel better, I guess based off of that fact. I don't know what's the science behind their mentality, which is very like, you know, when I think about it, it's just like very immature thinking. You know, it's kind of like I got the clubhouse and I don't want to let you in type shit. So mm -hmm. um, I think that um, what the black people were fighting for was like, yo, we helped build this country. So I think that we should be able to um, have the option to going to into facilities um that is um for the public um i think that that's initially what it was for and you know it trickles down into education and other areas as well i think that that that's what initially it was for I, but what it created was 
all that came in a package deal so you're getting that along with capitalism along with um feminism along with a lot of other ideological things that we not necessarily really ask for you know um mm -hmm. so i think that I think that when we got like affirmative action and other and other um, set asides from uh, the bills that was passed, civil rights bill, etc., I think that we felt as though okay, our politicians put us in a position that we we can um, be a lot better than what we were. So let's take advantage of that. So they went full throttle into assimilation or integration and capitalism. And we didn't really like know the effects of, you know, capitalism. And um, so it kind of changed the culture. It changed the culture slowly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? it, it definitely did. And do you think that we're integrated too far in? To work our way out like where do you gauge the, the current state of black people in this part of the world do you think we're too far in to get out and we might we might as well just make our best room within this uh house that we're in or, or try to get out like what where, where do you gauge us um as far as what integration has done and, and the goal of it and where you see us um i don't think that we're too integrated now it's real close though i mean it's, it's kind of close um, I, you know, I did a show yesterday about a, a black girl that's saying, it's, you know, she's saying that she's white. And there's a lot of layers to that, you know. Um, I think that um, within our culture, it's always going to be a sense of rebellion. You know, long, you know and, and it may be something like, as long as you're still seeing people standing up against police brutality, making it a race issue. You, you feel me like as opposed to like um, a classism issue like when when you see like totally where if we're totally assimilated mentally they wouldn't even bring up race they'll be like okay this lower class person is being discriminated on you know because he his image or they would have they wouldn't even bring race into the um picture you know mm -hmm. so i think that um until that happens i think that there's still a chance because people are seeing that they're doing things to us systematically based off a of race, you know. So, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's how I, I feel about uh, that. Yeah. And, and and what do you say to? Because I did watch your show. As far as that that girl with the with the European demon possession, that's what it reminded me of. It seemed like you know she needed like an exorcism or something to, to get that that demon that European demon up out of her. So with our people now that that's not natural that, that's definitely unnatural our people uh don't generally have that but what do we do with the ones that are amongst us that have that mentality that are in the sunken place that do want to assimilate and don't see the benefit of exiting out or of a black suit what do you say to that black person if you can say anything to them at all well i think that is a lot more than what we think. I think that the 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 sister on there is a lot smarter than what we think. I think what she was doing was making a statement. I think what she was doing was um exposing something about our culture. I think that's what she was uh I, and I'm I, when I say our culture, I'm talking about Americans period, not white, black, etc. Cause if you if you um, like when you see the whole story, like um, you notice it was a segment where the psychiatrist was like, well, the mother was the one that planted the seed because she was the one that told her that she was white when she was a little girl. Mm. So when did she get the wake up call? Was it at school? You know, was it outside with her peers? Who told her that she was black? You know what I'm saying? Who told her? So I'm 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 assuming that if it occurred like from her peers. Obviously, they was making fun of her. So she had a very bad wake-up call. Whatever the case may be, whether it was her mother pulling her to the side, like, oh, you're, you're really black. You know, whatever the case may be, it had an impact on her. So I think what she was doing was 
she was she came to the conclusion that if her mother's going to lie to her like that, then she got to question everything. And I think what she was actually doing was she was being real facetious. She was acting like a white person and she was she was um she was acting like a white person and she was kind of exposing how white people really feel about us. Hmm. At the same time getting back at her mother because of what her mother did. I think she was doing that because you could see kind of like she didn't really want to um be perceived as somebody that's angry. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. She was she wanted to be perceived as a person that is you know, we can have a conversation about this. I'm not going to get emotional. I'm going to sit here. Okay, you don't like what I said. I apologize. You know, she even did that. You know, it was like she wanted to get a point across, you know, and she wanted to at the same time challenge um, uh, a lot of the fake shit that goes on in our society. Like when everybody was clapping, you could kind of see, like, you got to pick up on that. This is a 16-year-old girl. She's standing in front of this big-ass crowd. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. She's not your average 16-year-old girl. She's very conservative. She sat down. She wasn't nervous. You know, she took it all on. This is like a big ass. She's being recorded. All this shit is floating around everywhere. You know what I'm saying? Now, like, so this ain't your average 16-year-old black girl. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I think that she was doing that on purpose to prove a point. That's what it seemed like to me. I think that she was pretty much saying two things. She was saying she was getting back at her mother for what her mother did at the same time saying that you can't define who I am and shit. So when, like, me, when, me, all, when all the motherfuckers began to clap, you see her expression, and then when all the people stood up, it was like, okay, who was racist in the audience? You know, um, um, who, who disagreed with what she's saying? Stand up. And all the white people stood up. She's like, yeah, right. You know, y'all y'all doing that, you know, it's fake, which was real. Mm -hmm. Like, probably 90% of the motherfuckers have racist views. If not, is mm -hmm. a hardcore or 100% racist. You know? So, this is the I, fake I, shit. I, this is like the illusion of inclusion. This is like them being on code. And she just was like kind of exposing that. That's kind of how I seen it. I think that uh, she is hurt by what her mom did, so she wanted to embarrass her mother. Mm. And I'll take you here. Now, your your analysis of it, I've never heard that before. And I think that's a definitely a outside-the-box type of perspective. In my opinion, I don't think that she's that in tune with the racial dynamic to do that. I think it's more so something that um, Dr. Amos Wilson talks about where he, he basically talks about the possession the, in, in not in a spooky sense, but the sense that we all as black people have a little bit of white supremacist in us. And it me, meaning that we have taken in the parts of self hate, the parts of white supremacist European ideology and we've embedded that within us, that we sometimes see the world from their world view. And I take the position that she has that. She has a, a white woman living inside of her, hypothetically, of course, not you know physically, but has that mentality of a white person living inside of her because everything she's been indoctrinated through the TV, through the media, through education, um, she has that and she's seen that. So that's what I think that is. And that's kind of what Dr. Amos Wilson talks about. I'm not saying that, you know, I disagree with what you're saying. I just don't think that she has that many layers to her. But what do you think Well, I, about that I possession? Think that, I think that based off of how she did it, you know, I think that even a person that believes those things would not be that direct in their rhetoric. It's a reason why, you know, that's coming from a place of hurt. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like for her to be saying, like, I'm not going to even talk to the hood rat. That's like overemphasizing that. She was she was she was overemphasizing some points like she didn't want to be around 
the black girl that was trying like like what why are you doing that like you don't want to have a conversation with her like what's the whole purpose of that it's mm-hmm. kind of like the attention i think that it wasn't she wasn't really doing it like she, it was almost like a um subconscious thing that actually came to fruition it's kind of like uh her her attention may be um to once again what i believe was to embarrass her mother but it exposed something in the process i think that she um by the mere fact that how she did it i'm white like you know like i'm white now you got people who act like that but they would never say that i'm white you know they would never say that okay yeah well um you rarely hear a black person publicly be that forthcoming about uh stereotypical views or their perception of other black folks you know what i'm saying okay yeah they're all and then she just generalized all of them like not even separating the classes or inner city from this or that she say all of them she wanted to make a point you know what i'm saying that's what it kind of seems to me um that's what and, it kind of and, seems to me like she no. she was kind of like um she was kind of trying to prove something you know and i think that it came from a place of her obviously her mother uh played a role into um indoctrinating her with certain aspects of the rhetoric i i do agree with you that um her perceptions may be uh eurocentrically centered you know like far as when they took her into the white i think that that was real when she went into the white town and she would like, you know, liked it better. And I think that that was real. But I think that, you know, um, the the rhetoric that she was so outwardly about it, like, you know, yeah, well, all blacks are, you know, they're disgusting. And then, you know, I think that he's going to steal. And, you know, that was kind of like she was being, um, she was overemphasizing some points that um, usually people would um, word differently or um, they would either word it differently or they would uh, fake it. They would act like it doesn't even exist. Because I think the reason that that happens is because as a black person, you're allowed to talk down to other black people. Like a lot of time, the prominent black figures, they get their edge. They get their notoriety by talking down to other black people. You see political figures will will come out and they'll start out with the black accountability stuff, beating down on black people to gain notoriety. Candace Owens did it. Um, Anthony Brian Logan um, a, lot, a lot of people who are trying to gain their footing within white society in a political realm or if anything else, they start out by by talking down on black people. So she sees that she understands that to advance. And you can you can openly talk down about black people as much as you want. And unless you're white, you won't really get that much um, flack for it because white people, they have they've established a code that are right, we can we can treat the Negroes like garbage. But don't tell them to their face but other black people they can talk down on, on blacks all day but they won't allow them to say you know any of those things about white people and they definitely won't give her a platform or somebody like me a platform to tell white people about themselves so she sees that in in society has normalized being able to talk down and and denigrate other black people uh, and it's, it's also indicative that she understands certain aspects of racism by the mere fact that she would say when all the white folks stood up that yeah yeah yeah, yeah you, you do that in public but behind the scenes you type in um you know you troll and you expose your racist view secretly so that shows right there that she understood modern day racism mm-hmm. by the mere yeah. fact that she would say that by the mere fact that she would say yeah yeah y'all y'all, y'all do that in public but you know behind the scenes y'all actually are racist so would she call herself a racist too well, that 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 is what caught me because it's like, damn. Well, if you was able to see and know that she identified white folks as white folks, and she said, she she said, well, yeah, y'all do that in public, but behind the scenes, y'all are racist. So she knows two things. She exposed that one. She knows that she's black. Two, that she understands how white people think and how they operate and how they are more covert with their racism. And, and speaking of which, I'm going to just get to one, to a question in the chat real quick. And you know, race is my topic. I could, you know, build on race all day. That's yeah, what I, I like. I, I'm going to feature you on this channel just probably maybe once a week. I'm going to um, get some clips 
I'm, I'm gonna get some clips together. Um, whether it's like a discussion with maybe um, Tucker Carlson or somebody off of Fox News, because they always got mm-hmm. some things that they're talking about. Um, or it maybe even on uh, CNN. I'm gonna get a couple of clips and I'm gonna I'm play them or any hot topic concerning um, uh, issues dealing with politics or race. And uh, we're gonna um, find a good name for it. And um, you know, we're gonna have you uh, break some things down and kind of build like how we build it now. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. That that's a hundred percent. That's my lane. That's you know what I spend my time and energy on. And uh, big game. He asked, uh, "What would you say to a black person regarding people like Timothy Wise, Rebecca Pettit, Peggy McIntosh, Jane Elliott, etc.? Um, all of those people who are classified as white. And for those the listening audience, those are white people who do something similar to what I do. They have workshops. They do lectures. They talk about." white privilege. They rarely say uh, white supremacy. They talk about white privilege. And what they do is they try to talk to other white people about white privilege and say, hey, you know, we should do something different. We should treat black people um, different. Or would you like being treated like this? And the, the thing that I would tell black people to refer back to is a chart that I put up that shows the covert and the overt racist white supremacists. Peggy McIntosh, Farrah Winfrey, Tim Wise, all of them fall under the umbrella of racism, white supremacy. They're just on the covert side. If they were truly interested in helping out black society, um, they would have done something by now. They have the, the, the pool. They have the resources. They have the ability to do something tangible, but they will not. They have not and they won't because they see that they're, they have the ability to pimp out white guilt. Pimping out white guilt being as though, all right, let me have a workshop and make white people feel bad about themselves and have them pay me money. That, that's what that white um, class of people talking about white privilege does. So all of them are suspected of being racist until proven otherwise. I've said all, this is capital letters, underline it, exclamation point, all white people are racist until proven otherwise. That 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 encompasses Jane Elliott, Tim Wise. Bear Winfrey, all of them, uh, all of the other ones, too. And, and speaking of which, it does get me into because if you look at what they do and what they charge, Tim Wise, he charges about um, forty five hundred dollars for um, a workshop. Jane Elliott, last time I checked, hers were about five thousand. Um, Claude Steele, his is about that five thousand uh, mark that they charge to do lectures, to do presentations, to do workshops. And then here I come, you know, with my price and people, oh, you trying to rob the people I'm like, dude, like if you go see what my competitors are charging, they won't give you the same clarity. They won't give you anything practical. They will not talk about the elephant in the room and they're going to charge you five, six, seven times as much as what I charge. And, you know, here I am trying to start up a business, trying to get out from economic slavery from white people and have my own business that I can run and I can still make a difference and I can start to help black people out. And I'm trying to start a business for that. And then people come around, oh, you charging too much. You need to be working for free because we had this mentality that if that other black people should be either one, we look at black people, you need to do exactly what I tell you to do. You need to work when I tell you to work. I charge $500 for my workshops. I charge 500 um, on the lowest end. One of my competitors charge 4,500 and I charge 500 uh, for my workshops. And as you can see, all my stuff is research grounded. Um, all of my stuff is backed by is, is backed by research. I give you practical, tangible things you can do. Um, and I'm trying to truly help out black people. Though the, the, the other people that are doing this, white people, specifically the white privilege crowd, they have no interest in that. And they charging you way more money and they won't do work for free. Like I do work for free, too. Like and I don't have any problem with that. Like even if somebody reached out, they emailed me, say, hey, you know, I don't have it like that. I'm in D.C. If you in D.C. or Virginia or, you know, Southern Maryland, you're not that far from me and you want me to come to your school, to your church, I'll do it for free. I met two brothers at the um, Black Male Educator Conference. I did this presentation there. They lived right over in D.C. I talked to them and I did it for free. So I I don't mind doing work for free if it's going to help out black people. So I'm not in this trying to 
get rich off of that. But at the end of the day, I still got bills that need to get paid. You know, I put time and energy into this business and into my craft. I trademarked the word solving the race problem. I own the trademark to that. Like, I, I'm not just here pulling stuff out of thin air. I, I created a, a logo, my marketing. Like, I have a website. I do all this stuff on my own. So me coming around and trying to, you know, get paid for my time and my energy, I don't think that that's, you know, ridiculous um, to ask. But but straight um, back to the other point about Jane Elliott and all of those white people that talk about white privilege, I would highly recommend that you do not use the word white privilege. We call it by what it is, which is white supremacy, which really shines the light on what they're doing. And all of them are um, suspected, suspected racist until proven otherwise. And um, let me see. They said it's a white supremacist in the chat. I haven't seen it, um, but I guess it is. But e either way, even the the white people of what, what they're charging and what they have to do, you also have a group of black people who are like Anthony Brian Logan is one, Candace Owens is one, Claude Steele, um, people like that which are the ignore racism group. I like to call it the ignore racism and behave camp. That's what they are. They're, they're the people that are talk about, Hey, let's, you know, ignore racism, behave better. Um, and they charge upwards of five, $6,000 to all. And, and all they're going to tell you is to behave better and ignore racism. You know, they're not giving you anything practical. I'm trying to do stuff and show you ways um, that you can not only benefit yourself, but benefit your circle of influence and, and truly change your reality and giving you options to do that. Because I know not all black people are going to agree on, on one thing, but I've done the market research. I, I see what white folks are charging and I know they're not giving you anything because I've been to their workshops. Keep in mind, I, I work in a school. So we do a quote unquote diversity training every year right in the summer before school starts. Um, they had one come in um, by, by flipping Wilson. He did one and no exaggeration, they charged the district $60,000 for, for a district workshop. It was a two day workshop, $60,000. And here, here I am charging 500 and y'all got a problem with me. But I think if I was white, y'all be saying, oh, that's a good deal. You changed my race. And just say, all right, you know, you a white man talk about this. Oh, 500. That's a good deal, you know, and not be everywhere. But again, since I'm black, I'm supposed to work for free. I'm supposed to do what you tell me to do when you want me to do it. And, um, you know, I, I'm not supposed to ask any questions. You know, that, that that's that's residual leftover plantation mentality that we still have. And, and we got to get rid of that. Because our European oppressors gave us that mentality because we're used to seeing other black people that need to be, you know, we feel like other black people because we've seen it. We've seen other black people work for free. You're supposed to work hard, work for free. Don't ask any questions and do it when I tell you to do it. You know, that's that same mentality when people come at me for, um, you know, what I, what I charge. Um. Let me see. Do you work at a private? I work at a public school and the racial makeup is it is predominantly Hispanic and white. It's only a ha handful of, of black kids, but I'm looking to transition into a more predominantly uh, black school, but it's predominantly white and Hispanic, the school I'm at. So I see a lot of the racial confusion. I just try to help the black kids that are there. And, you know, I've dealt with this because people will ask, well, why aren't you at an all black school? You know, your message, you should be teaching mostly black kids, which I agree with you. But another part of me also sees the black kids in the predominantly white schools and they are the future assimilationist Negroes. Unfortunately, the ones that go to the predominantly white schools are ones that are more than likely going to go to college, more than likely going to get a quote unquote good job, whatever that is, and get a quote unquote education, whatever that is. And those are going to be the ones that end up in the sunken place. 
So if I can start to transform the minds of the future assimilationist black kid, I can change their outlook. I can change their reality that they will not use their education and their training to further detriment black society. That's what I find most people do. Most people who go to college and get a degree and get a master's degree, accomplish the things that I've accomplished, they aren't doing anything to reach back and help black people. They immediately become individualized and start to talk about how racism doesn't exist because it didn't affect them. And we can't be confused by that. That is racial confusion. That is the illusion of inclusion that we believe because we have been allowed to prosper individually. Therefore, racism isn't going to affect you. But that was the game from the beginning. Racism intended to integrate you as an individual. We were never intended to integrate in as a group. You were intended to have the individual integrate within society. They succeeded when they get you to think like an individual. They succeeded when they get you to think like an individual because it caters, integration caters to the talented 10th Negro mentality, which is what? which is the so-called educated class, the so-called bourgeoisie wealthy class, the, the class of black people who are your intelligent slaves, your intellectual slaves, the ones that will go to your college and fight tooth and nail to be in your classroom at your Harvard, at your so-called prestigious universities. This is the talented 10th Negro, the skilled laborer, which is nothing more than a skilled laborer, uh, but they don't see themselves as that. They see themselves as the exception to the rule, not knowing that you could be the Negro exception, the Negro who doesn't have anything, okay? Uh, that was a genuine question, don't feel bad, Get money. Those are the ones that are gonna wanna spool by the bootstrap. Yeah, Dave East, you're right. That is gonna be the people who will tell you to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And sometimes we don't even have the damn boots on our feet. <laughs> Talking to people who, who don't have anything and all right, pull yourself up by the bootstraps because white society will sometimes try to force you to compare to say, hey, look, we did it. Why can't you? Because you put laws in place to say that we literally can't. You would kill black people who tried to. So then don't fast forward after you've benefit and you've had all of the um, good things, all of the luxuries of society, and then reach back as if that has nothing to do with it, as if white people's wealth in this day and time had nothing to do with antebellum slavery off the free labor of the black people who you descend from. No? But that's the reality of it. And I hope that answered your question. I know I went on a you know few tangents. Um, but you know, if people if, if anybody wanted to come in and ask questions, I'm not opposed to it. Um, if anybody had any more questions in the chat, not opposed. Um, or if you had anything, Solomon. It says uh um it says we need a code and solar vision needs to make up your mind where you are. Uh, yeah, I kind of, kind of miss. I guess didn't type it right. Where you are going from Dr. Welsing and Cynthia G to endless debates on religion, we are watching you and hope you will do better in the future. <laughs> what did that have to do um, with the conversation? I'll say um, now. No, like, that's why. I, like you know, I got different channels. Like the this channel doesn't have endless debate, so watch this channel like you know what i'm saying like right you know th that's why it's called the debate league i'm it's pretty clear as to what's going to be done on the debate league channel that's what the channel is entitled so if you want to uh come on this channel and you know uh, you know that's why you're here bro like i mean why that why did we have to hear that you know what i'm saying and, like this not it's not and, a contradiction it's just two different things i'm doing without realizing that he could do the same. He could be a producer of the content that he's saying that he wants to see. 
because the good thing about platforms like this, you got a few lanes, you got a few avenues of things that you want to see come to fruition, things you want to see put out into the forefront. So you created it and he could do the same thing. You got it. He got a YouTube account. You could do the same thing, start to put out the content that you want us to see. And I mean, in all honesty, it's not many platforms of true black conscious groups that are talking about the things you're talking about on this channel. Um, but that doesn't mean that it can't be created. And his, his comment about... Um, and, and people don't understand, like, the cultural aspect of, you know, solving the race problem. You know what I'm saying? Like, we like to argue sometimes. We like to debate. We like to laugh. All that got to be aspects of the cultural revolution. You know what I'm saying? Like, we need a conscious comedian. We need a conscious rapper. We need a conscious TV show. We need a conscious... Because, like, not everybody is the I'm going to sit and listen to a lecture for five hours type of person. The average person is not that. The average person is like, okay, I want to... Okay, maybe you could make it a little funny and maybe you could, you know... I watch this TV show. It's an interesting TV show. and We got creativity. You know what I'm saying? So when I'm doing like the debates, that's all that is. You know what I mean? We're not talking about who's the best rapper or who's the best football player as what black people does all day in the barbershop. We're talking about, you know, religion. We're talking about politics, you know? So it's kind of... Yeah, the same thing, but you know, let's talk about something a little more conscious. That's the mm -hmm. goal. And you know? that's an interesting point about as far as conscious entertainment. And that, that I like the concept that you know the the the, the battle league because that'd be a conscious lane for you know for black people because we, we do need conscious entertainment. Although I wouldn't consider this might be edutainment, but you know, in the end, conscious entertainment, conscious comedians because we're bombarded with so much self-hate, so much misandry, so much nonsense that having a conscious lane with those things might not be a bad idea. Um, and if I could, I would just go address what he said. I'm going, shout out to, you know, rest in power to Dr. Francis Cress Wells and anybody in DC. Um, I don't know if y'all are, you know, close to the area, but they do have a Francis Cress Wells Institute at Howard um, every second Thursday, once a month, you know, a lot of good information going down there. Um, he did say about Cynthia G. I've been on Cynthia G channel. I like what that sister has to say. A lot of time people try to beat her, beat up on her, but her her what she's saying is true. I don't I don't think we like the message of it, but what she's saying is true. I've been on her channel. Uh endless debates on religion. Okay, why why aren't black farmers in Zimbabwe teaching Africans on farming? Black farmers are here losing. Yeah, that's true. Black people on the continent, let me say this black people on the continent are some of, I hate to say this, and, and please don't take it the wrong way, black people on the continent are some of the most lost black people. Some of the most lost black people. You have a conscious sect, I think, in South Africa, but the black people in Zimbabwe, black people in Nigeria, black people in Ghana, I'm not saying all. I'm saying the ones that I've interacted with. Black Ethiopians are included in that too. Because I've been to Ethiopia and I'm telling you, and I know a lot of Ethiopians, especially in this part of DC, not all of them are conscious. We can't assume that just because they're on the continent, they are conscious. A lot of the Africans that they've allowed to come over, the black people that are Africans allowed to come over, don't have the same consciousness as a black person here in America. Not saying that they're not our brothers, not saying we shouldn't build with them, but we have a different mentality because we are in the belly of the beast. We are right next to the most powerful white supremacists anywhere in the world. So why aren't they showing other black farmers in Zimbabwe? Because they probably don't know. Yes, we're you losing out I, on a great opportunity too, for them to reclaim the land. Up, um, solving the race problem. I, I noticed that I was looking at a lot of junk because I did a show actually on... Um, I did a show on interracial marriages, and uh, when I was looking for material on YouTube, what I found was that a lot of the interracial marriage involved second-generation Africans. And 
you know, it's not the, you know, the quote unquote sl slaves that send the Africans. You know, a lot of the videos that I've seen, it, w it was like more so um, second generation immigrants from Africa, second, third generation immigrants from Africa, as opposed to um, slave descendant, uh, enslaved uh, African uh, um, who, who was over here in America. Could you say the first part of that again? What about them? Yeah, I was just saying that I noticed that a lot of the um, interracial dating, when I was oh, looking yeah, for yeah. material on YouTube, when I when I was doing a presentation not too long ago, and then, you know, they was having, like, videos where, you know, there would be a black woman and a white man. And uh, about eight times out of ten, the black woman was a either a second or third generation African immigrant. Mm -hmm. As opposed and to somebody that actually went back into chattel slavery. So it wasn't really like the sisters who um, have um, ancestors who were enslaved that is actually doing it. It's more so second, third generation um, African immigrants. Because I think that they sometimes are confused by the fact that they're not around white people as often. A lot of times, even like South Africa, they have a really small white population. So when they do see white people, they don't have the same direct violence and vitriol toward them when the white person comes around um they might be coming off dropping off a bag of rice handing out medicine or building a church so they can equate that with, wow when white people come around we're getting things without realizing they're giving you shots um that aren't anything helpful for you they're building a church to further des um, destroy you they're probably giving you rice so they could take a bag of of diamonds in exchange so even though on the surface level, these things might appear to be nice acts, we don't see the, 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 the first or second generation African doesn't see that. So then when they come to another part of the world, come to this part of the world, they don't have that same bad taste in their mouth about white people that black people here have. Like if you have a conscious brother here who's sleeping white, he has no excuse. He knows what's going on. He knows he should know a lot better. But the first or second generation African who hasn't had those same experiences, they're confused about their racial position. It doesn't mean that what they're doing is right because they still shouldn't either. But I think they're more confused um, about their racial position more so than anything. And uh, big game, I'm gonna disagree with you, big game. Uh, Cynthia G, that's anti-black male rhetoric, mass and anti-racism. That's not true, man. I think I think if you really listen to what she's saying and truly give it a chance, she talks about racism, white supremacy. She shines a light on that. Any black person doing that, you at least got to hear their perspective. Because if they have a racial identity, they have clarity on their racial position, you at least got to give a chance to what they say and what they are. Um, you know, her, her position at least, but I don't think that is mass, um, that is the black, the black male rhetoric. I don't, I don't find her message any different than what, um, Shahrazad, I mean, uh, Zaza Ali, Shahrazad Ali, what they put forth, it's just in a different lane. And, and honestly, if Cynthia G was a black man, y'all would, y'all would at least hear her out, hear it out. Because if a black man said them same things, y'all would agree. And, and I don't look at it that way. I mean, what she's saying is true. That's how we got to um, validate it. Uh, Africans just look at some Africans. I, I, do think, look her message, black I think her message is similar to uh, Zaza Ali, but not Sherazad. Which, which, which one was the elder? Is that Sherazad or Zaza? Which one? Was uh, that's Sherazad Ali, the one that wrote the book, okay. The Black Man's Guide on Understanding the Black Woman. I think that what she was doing was kind of opposite of what. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Same lane, different tactic. They're trying to uplift black men, same lane. You think that tactic. Cynthia G is trying to uplift black men? I think so. I think so. I think she's trying to do that by lighting a fire under us, by telling her you're not protecting us. You don't have nothing going on in society. Not not all black men cater. Not all black men respond well to just being nurtured, to having a nurturing. All right, come on, you still a god? Like let's do it. That not all black men gonna respond to that. Some might, but some also need you know a foot in the ass. And, and, and lighting a fire under them to, yo, get up. You're not protecting the black women. You're sleeping with white women too much. 
Um, y'all, y'all aren't doing anything. Why y'all talking about hair and makeup? Why won't y'all go fight the white man back? You know, even though we we might not, we might get mad at that. It's true, and it's real. I think they they're both trying to do the same thing. They just have a different way of going about it, and both of them are needed. I listen to you argue. Okay, I, I do agree with that, brother DJ. BG, listen to you argue capitalism over racism, which is more powerful. Right, racism, white supremacy is the key factor. It isn't, it doesn't matter what economic system you are in. You can interchange everything, go to Russia, uh, start implementing communism, and they hate black people over there too. So either way you want to put it, um, black people would still be subject to racism, white supremacy, because that is the controlling agenda. Not who, um, not econ not, not what economic system you're in, is who's controlling it. Uh, why are we worried about Africa? We got to start in our environment first, then help others. We can't see the Africans as, as others. Those are our brothers and sisters. That's who you descend from. We might disagree with their political ideology, but those are our brothers and sisters and elders, okay? So they're not others. They're a part of us, and we have to be worried about Africa because Garvey once said, as far as Africa goes, we go. If Africa's in a destroyed position, a destroyed situation, so are you. Anywhere you are, claiming to be an African. So you have to be worried about the condition of Africa. Does that mean we shouldn't be worried about this part of North America that we're in? No, absolutely not. Because we built this country too. My 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 ancestors died for um this country, fought in every single war. So is this ours too? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean we gotta um ignore what's happening over in Africa. We, we still have to um keep that in mind. Um Africans look down on black Americans. Um, I don't know if I agree with that fully. It, it might have something to do with, it might have something to do with, they have a different value system. They see value in education. They, because they, they oftentimes don't have access to the same education that we have access to here in their home country. They don't have the access to the same type of education we do. I'm just making a generalization. I'm saying every place in Africa, because there are some parts of Africa that have a way better education system than here in the United States. But just for lack, just you know, the purposes of moving the conversation along, they don't have the same access to that. So when they come over here, they see value in education that black people here don't see. Rightfully so, that black people in this part of the world don't see value in education because we've been miseducated through it. Um, for so many years that we see that it's nonsense. And I think a lot of the brothers um, don't understand that or they don't see the same thing. The brothers from the continent don't see and understand the same things. That, that's, what, that's what I think that boils down to. Not necessarily do they look down on us. They have a different value system. And we can't convince them that, hey, going to a, a, um, a high school going to a middle school, going to school with white folks for 12 years, walking across the stage, getting a hat and a diploma and a piece of paper with your name on it, letting white folks pat you on the back and pat you on the head, let you walk across their stage and wear a robe and get all dressed up, line up all of them, um, the, the Africans that graduate and ask them what do they know how to do. Or at, even ask the black people that walk across the stage, now what do you know how to do? You went to that white folks school for 12 years. You did everything they asked you to do. Now, what do you know how to do? Nothing. I'm going to go to their college too. All right. Line them up. Go to their college for another four years. Okay. Wear your hat. Wear your robe. Line them up. What do you know how to do? They, they, and, and they, they give you a blank stare because black people get miseducated through the institutions to go be a well-paid slave. Your racial position hasn't changed by how much education that white people have allowed you to get. 
that's where I think some of the disconnect comes from the brothers from the continent, some of the brothers on the continent, as opposed to the, the other Africans and black people that are here. We know that at the end of the road, education is nonsense. And you could only use education to further yourself within white society. Anything practical, all of the stuff that I really learned and all the stuff I really know that has helped me has been through independent study. There hasn't been uh, a time where I've been sitting in a classroom and a white teacher has told me, a white teacher or a white professor has given me anything practical and good that I've been able to use and help my people at all, ever. And I went to their high school for 12 years. I went to their undergrad co college for four years. I went to their master's program for another two years and I haven't heard it once. So unless you went through that same path and you could tell me something that you've heard otherwise or you've had um, this good white figure help you out and give you all these practical things, that shows you don't understand your racial position because they miseducate you, they indoctrinate you to be a better better slave. Uh, big game, that's not true. You gotta stop caping for, the comment says you gotta stop caping for Africans, they don't ever cape for us. They come over here and act like the white supremacists. I'm going to disagree with you on this end. Do some of them? Yes. They do cape for us. That's why I talked about Julius Malima earlier. That's a brother from South Africa doing what Kwame Nkrumah did, doing what Idi Amin did, doing what Steve Bantu Biku did, which tried to unify the black people in this part of the world and the black people on the continent. To say we're all still brothers. Like, even though we're here, we didn't forget about you. We see what the white supremacists are doing to you over there. We know that. The white supremacists are doing the same thing to us over here in South Africa with apartheid. He's he's noting that. He's saying that. So I think if more black people um, read and listen to his speeches and look, look up the economic freedom fighters, you might start to see that not all Africans are over there trying to cooperate in with white folks. Abdul, you're smart enough to know we got to get black Americans together first. Uh, that might be true. I I've said that I think there's something significant about black people in this part of the world. I do. Because again, we're the most comfortable. We know the white supremacists the best because we've been right up underneath them for the last 400 years. We have access to the most technology. We have access to the most resources. We have the most elbow room. We have access to the most um, distribution channels, distribution networks, manufacturing channels, manufacturing networks. We have access to the most wealth. Okay. So is there something significant about us? Yes. We are the catalyst. Black people in this part of the world are the catalyst. We are the ones that are going to spark the revolution. Us here, this group of black people, we are the ones that are going to spark the revolution. I'm not going to sit around and wait for another group of black, black people somewhere else. I've met black people in other places. The UK, Ethiopia on the continent, black people in Asia. I don't think the catalyst is going to come anywhere other than right here where you are. I see the fire in brothers from Chicago. I see the fire in brothers from DC. I see the fire in brothers in Philly. Okay. It's going to come right here from us. Another question. Um, do you think Malima is going to welcome black Americans to Africa after they take the land back? Why wouldn't he? Why, why wouldn't he? Especially black Americans. I, I have heard some talk about him discriminating against some of the blacks from Nigeria that are coming over. But at least black people in this part of the world, they they see us as, you know, somewhat beneficial to, you know, an economic structure. We have the education that they value a lot of times. So I, I think that they wouldn't have any problem molding black people from this part of the world into South African society. But once they get the land back, um, African society, unless they get rid of the white supremacists, it doesn't really matter because the white supremacists there 
aren't going to give up that land easily. It, it, it's not. It's not going to happen. Because, and you might have a lot of resistance from black people there who are still celebrating uh, Va Vasco da Gama Day. You know, the, the celebration of when their conquerors came. So you got a lot of confused black people there. Similar to black people over here celebrating Columbus Day. It's no different. But that doesn't mean that he would be against us in some way after he's made it pretty clear that he is for the black people in this part of the world. Okay, Davies, I appreciate the correction. He isn't against Nigerians. I was just mentioning something that I heard that he wanted to suppress some of the immigration from them. I'm not saying that he um, that he did anything wrong. I, that's why I was uh, mentioning that. Uh, most black Americans in our history received higher education from these institutions and created American advancements. That was from the stone gatherer. Well, if we have gone to their college and learn so much history from them how come that isn't manifesting itself within society and things like wealth and land ownership business ownership black people black people do celebrate columbus day black people celebrate every holiday mm -hmm. i would i would say we're right on the eve of black people celebrating halloween black people celebrate every holiday Columbus Day included. But let me tell you the crazy part about what racism and white supremacy has set up. Even if you don't want to celebrate a holiday, you have to. White society has set it up to where so you have to celebrate their holidays because they'll close down all of the businesses. They'll close down your job. They won't deliver mail. It won't be a normal day. So even if you don't want to celebrate it, they try to force you into celebrating. So yes, black people do Celebrate Columbus Day. I've seen it. Um, they're about to black people about to go celebrate Halloween. We celebrate every European holiday collectively. That's why I would recommend black people check out um, the work by Dr. Ashoka, Ashoka Musa Barishango, the European, I mean the European, the mental side of celebrating European holidays which he breaks down every single holiday and shows his European origin or his destructive origin. Everything from Christmas to Thanksgiving to Halloween to Easter to St. Patrick's Day to Columbus Day to any other one of these holidays that we want to participate in. Okay. But we're getting a lot of um, a lot of good questions, Dave East. Uh, how do they look down on you? Give me an example. Well, no, I'm not. I'm saying that some Africans may come over because they value education more so than the average black person in this part of the world. They would use the education to somewhat look down. That's why I went into that example of they value the education. We do not see value in the education here. Rightfully so, we don't see value in it because it hasn't benefited us. They do haven't learned think, that um, lesson yet. That's why. Do you think that um do you think that some Africans bought into a lot of things that they were told about us and kind of hold those stereotypical views against us? And also do you feel that some Africans want to um separate themselves from us, uh, you know, um, in hopes of gaining more privilege in the overall greater society. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and we do the same thing to them. We, we talk about the African booty scratcher. We, we, we say, you know, I thought all Africans were poor. We, we say the same type of misinformation, the same type of self-hate. We pass along the same things that they say to us. So the Africans saying to us that we're dumb, um, that we're lazy, uh, that we don't really know how to work hard, that we just want handouts. 
you know, that the misinformation that they're spreading toward us, we are equally spreading it back to them. But here's how I find clarity in it. We have to look at the person who's pulling the strings and getting us to argue with one another. The racist white supremacists are always to blame. They're the ones putting in, setting up the condition to make us fight and argue while they sit back and laugh at us. Are there words, um, a kafir? I do know of some words that they call to, to denigrate us, to, to, to disrespect um, black people in this part of the world. And we have words that disrespect um, Africans as well. But I'm saying we need to squash all of that. We need to dead all of that because we're all on the same team, like it or not. If you want to be an aboriginal, um, if you want to be a Moor, Africans on a continent, if you want to be a Hebrew, Africans on a continent are your brothers. We're all on the same team. Okay. Are there going to be arguments, even though we all on the same team? Yes. Does that mean we all got to be best friends on the same team? No. Does that mean we got to agree on the mission to get the white man's foot off of our neck? That's what we got to get on the same page about. Will there be brothers from Africa that come over here that call you names as a black person? Yes. Are there, black, are there Africans that will come over here and look to integrate into white society and try to get a, a good job and a, a good house and call you lazy and, and, and adopt some of that racist white supremacist narrative? Yes, that will happen because they are confused. But so are black people. The, the black American is confused as well. We are both confused. We can't look at them over in Africa and pretend we got it all right. And the brothers in Africa can't look at us and pretend that they got it all right. We are on the same team. Okay. And I, and I stand by that. that is there some in-house fighting? Yeah, but let's handle that in-house. You know, if you got an issue with a brother from Africa, let's handle that in-house. We don't got to put that out in the society. We don't got to put that on the forefront so white people can hear us arguing and hear each other and calling each other names. We don't need to do that. Put that on the back burner. Handle that in-house if you got a problem with any of the brothers from the continent. Okay? Uh, sometimes people just want to be anti-African for the sake of being so. I agree. I absolutely agree. We do. We, we hate everything that is African. But I'll take it back to the people who did that to us. They conditioned us to hate everything African. They made African a bad word. They took your language and would beat you or kill you for trying to speak that language. They took your culture and beat you if you didn't have a part, if you didn't want to be a part of that culture. If you tried to maintain your culture, whether that's your eating habits, your food, your clothes, your anything. You know, so even an example of if I'm and I'll give you an example of what I do. If I wear a suit, you know, and a dress shirt to work, if I dress like a European, nobody will say anything to me. Like it'd be business as usual. Life goes on. I'm dressed like a European. The days that I choose to wear a dashiki, you should see the reactions. People will, hey, wh what is that? You know, that looks different. What is that? Hey, it's, you know, it's a dashiki. I got it from West Africa. Oh, I, I didn't know. You're you're African? You, what, you, you can't tell that, you know, did you not know that black people are from Africa? Yeah, 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 but I didn't know that, you know, you were African. You know, they, they get the cognitive dissonance of, whoa, what's going on? This African person is practicing and, and using something that's a part of their culture. What's wrong with you? What's happening? Why aren't you dressed like a European like we conditioned you to? That's the underlying message of what they're saying. Why, why aren't you dressed like us, like Europeans, like we conditioned you to do? Why are you trying to do that? If I tell people I'm learning another language, the automatic one is what? You learn Spanish? No, I'm learning Swahili and I'm hard. What's that? A language that they speak in Ethiopia and a language they speak in West Africa. Why are you learning that? Because I'm African. That's why. You know, they will see that as us straying away from what white society has given us, taking away the culture, taking away the language, 
taken away everything that you were supposed to hold on about yourself. So are we being anti-African just because? Yes, because that's what white folks taught us to do. No, they they laugh at, I think John Herrick Clark said something along the lines of, they laughed at your names and you changed it. They laughed at your clothes and you changed it. They laughed at your religion and he stops there. And that's what I'm gonna do the same thing to you. And you can pick up the message that I'm putting down. And they made a joke out of what you saw as cultural to the fact of you can't participate in anything African without them thinking something is wrong with you. Even in Philly, Philly, um, I used to go to Adun Day uh, back in the day. It's, it's a summer festival in Philly. And um, people would ask, oh, you going to that African festival? We not know Africans. Confused Negroes would say that. And I'm like, well, well, what are you then? I don't know, but I ain't no African. You know? So we don't even have a clear understanding of who we are. We just know that we're programmed to hate Africa and hate everything about it. We're programmed to hate the religions of Africa, the spiritual systems of voodoo. We're programmed to be spooked out and afraid of everything African. So Davies, I agree with you a thousand percent. Uh, with this brother saying, the crowd selling my ancestors, can't go to the back burner. The, um, they're, I don't know if they said they're proud of selling your ancestors. So that black people are proud to sell your ancestors. Um, as far as the, this is a touchy subject, as far as black people participating in the slave trade, here's my condensed answer. The black people that were participating in the slave trade were co-opted to do so. I don't think that they were willing participants that would do that on their own accord. And I say that because there is no word in West African language that would um, equate to the word of prison. We didn't necessarily have the concept of subjugating people, locking them up in the cages and taking their humanity away. The version of slavery that we see and we experience was unlike anything the world has ever seen. The dehumanization process. We went through a vicious period with the Arabs in the uh, Indian Ocean slave trade, but the indentured servitude that was within Africa and acted on other black people, you would never be able to find something as grotesque as dehumanizing as what Europeans um, did to us. I'm saying that because if we want to say that black people were participants in it, it would be the analogy of somebody pointing a gun at you and saying, you either stab and kill this person or I'm going to kill you. And the first law is, of, of humanity is self-preservation. We want to preserve ourselves. So if we did have to say, you know what, to preserve myself, I'm going to have to kidnap the brother in this, you know, um, other tribe without realizing when you kidnap the other brother because they gave you guns and showed you a way to kidnap and kill people, they put you on a slave ship right with them. They didn't have any, the European broke every treaty and agreement that they have ever formulated with anybody. If you think that they formed some type of agreement with you, the Portuguese, any one of them Europeans, that they formed some type of agreement and said, you know what, you get us that tribe over there and we got a deal, we won't kidnap you. Can you show me that? Because that didn't happen. They would come back with the other Africans, the other tribe, the rival, and they get hit in the head and dragged on a slave ship too. OK, because if that was the case, we'd have a collection of, you know, specific types of African groups. And we did not. We had a plethora of different African groups all on a slave ship together. OK, so. I think we got to be very careful when we pass along that information of black people participating in the slave trade. I'm not saying that they didn't participate but if we're blaming fault you have to put the fault on the person who came over looking to buy human beings somebody came to the west coast of africa looking to buy humans okay they went over there to buy another person 
and enslave them. Why would that person, you know, why aren't we focusing on that? On the on the mentality of a person who wants to go buy another human and enslave them. Let's talk about the mentality of the, the European, more so than us just looking for another black person to blame. That's a tired conversation. Henry Louis Gates put that trash out and every scholar ripped him up for it when he tried to pose that, saying that the blacks, we're our own worst enemies, you know, saying that we're the cause of the slave trade because we participated in it. This is Henry Louis Gates' argument. I'm familiar with the argument. But it's an asinine argument that you have to give it context that the people who finance, okay, Africans didn't finance any boats. They didn't build any boats, any slave ships. They didn't make and mold and weld any chains and shackles. They didn't put the, the mast on a ship and formulate and get um, maps and figure out where to go. Europeans set the stage for every single aspect of slavery. They implemented it. And then you want to blame the person who had a small insignificant part of that? Come on, man. We could do a lot better than that. Okay. So they had to be sold. Okay. Trying to it's a lot of questions and I, I was trying to get to as many as I can, but you know, but uh I think that that'd be enough for the day. We uh like I said, I wanna um had a brother come on his channel a little more frequently and uh you know break some things down pertaining to his uh perspective on uh politics and uh race relations in America. So um definitely shout out to the brother. Uh, yeah, he just blessed y'all with a, a, a lot of information, man, and um, I think that uh, ultimately we got to have these discussions more frequently in order to come to some type of consensus as to what we're going to do about it. Um, once again, um, I believe personally it has to be something that's embedded in the culture, and uh, so, you know, definitely um, this uh, presentation and the question and answer uh, period was very informative with that being said we're going to sign out of here um we may be coming on uh we're going to come on later on on uh solar vision debate league um but we're going to see who you got debating we, tonight um no captain tazaria is supposed to come on um but for what for interview yeah but we're still trying to connect with them i know on saturdays they go out and they do um their proselytizing on saturday so we're going to see if we can uh get him um, on tonight. If not, I'm just going to come on and uh, have a, a panel discussion. Um, so we will be on later on. So uh, be on the lookout for that notification. And if you haven't done so, subscribe to all three channels, Solar Vision Debate League, Solar Vision, and uh, ITBM2 official channel. Uh, once again, shout out to Brother Abdul, solving a race problem. Uh, we'll see you guys later. Peace.